Hoop Dreams, the podcast, an Unlearning Network production. The man joining us today, any award-winning producer, 17, they say spent years, I say incredible years at ESPN, uh, created phenomenal and produced phenomenal legendary shows like Sports Center, Mike and Mike in the Morning, Sunday NFL Countdown, College Game Day, and that was just the beginning because his true passion has been about sports and faith. Currently, with the Sports Spectrum Network, joining us today is Jason Romano on the Hoop Dreams podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Will Gates, and that's my dog. Arthur A.G., thank you, Jason, for being here, buddy. Arthur, Will, this is a treat, my friend. Great to connect with both of you guys. And as a, as a guy who saw Hoop Dreams in the theaters when I was 21 years old and the early 90s. My gosh, this is cool to be on a Hoop Dreams podcast so many years later and see both of you guys doing well. So this is cool. Thanks for having me. It's interesting because you jumped the gun on us. That's actually our very first question to you is. Okay. <laughs> go, go for it. It literally is. Tell us about the first time you saw Hoop Dreams and where were you and who did you see it with? I love this question. So I saw this in, tell me what the year. It came out in 94, right? 94. Okay. So I saw this, I saw this in the fall of 94 in the theater. And I believe the theater, ironically, was called Spectrum Theater in <laughs> Albany, New York, where I was living. Uh, I was 20, just turned 21 years old. So we're all around the same age here mm-hmm, in 94. Mm-hmm. And I was living, I was in between colleges. So I went to a two-year school, got my associate's degree, took a couple of years off because like most kids at 20, I was a knucklehead and didn't know what I was doing. And mm-hmm. so I wanted to live my own life. And then I went back to school and got my four-year degree. But it was in those two years in 94 that I was working at a hospital in Albany, New York, living in my own apartment. And my roommate, Eddie Nieves, and I, uh, he's a huge basketball fan, just like I am. He actually played in college in Division Three, okay. And uh, we had both taken a couple years off. And at that time, we were like, this movie hoop dreams is getting all the reviews. We got to go see it. And we saw it in the theater. And I remember a few things that stood out. First of all, you guys were the same age. So it helped to relate to your journey, even though my journey was much different, but to watch it on screen, it was, it was a pioneer type of movie. I mean, there was nothing like that in the movie theater at that time, but I'm the biggest basketball fan at this time too. So I'm watching (laughs) it and I didn't know who you two were. Right until I saw the movie. But I said, wait a minute, is that Juwan Howard? And is that Weber? Weber? And all these guys at the five-star camp that was in the movie and the coaches that were featured in it. And I was fascinated with the process uh-huh. and I loved it. I loved every second of it. When it came out on VHS, we went and rented it, uh, got uh-huh. a copy. I mean, I <laughs> even told Will a couple months ago when we talked that I was I watch it on HBO now at least a couple times a year because it's just that good. So That is amazing. Somebody just hit me up on Twitter like 20 minutes ago and said it's on right now. It's on right now. There <laughs> yeah. you go. Say it's on right it now. Just, it, you crazy. guys must be finding out people coming to you who haven't, you know, who've, who've just discovered this movie that's been out yep. for 20 plus 30, almost 30 years. It's kind of crazy. It's a whole new different, uh, uh, I mean, like a generation of people. I mean, a, audience. a mixture yeah. of, of old you know, I mean, a lot of you wouldn't you wouldn't be a lot of basketball players haven't seen it. Mm-hmm. Right. And I would be curious to see like these younger basketball players, these 18, mm-hmm. 19, 20 year olds that are in college or just getting ready, coming right. out of high school to have them watch that and see what it was because it was a different time. Right. Mm-hmm. Like there is no yeah. Internet. And there's no cell phones yeah. and you're on the phone calls and you're reading the newspaper <laughs> and you're watching all-star games on TV, not on your phone. It was just a different time, yeah. but I, it took me back to being a kid in the late eighties, graduated high school in 91 and mm-hmm. watching college basketball was, was so big in the late eighties yeah. and early nineties and certainly the NBA as well and magic and bird and Jordan. Mm-hmm. So just having that, as the backdrop of your guy's story was just phenomenal. I love the movie. Did it did it impact you in in insert in in a kind of way? 
I think it did in a lot of ways because after that is when I, because my thing was I, I play basketball in high school guys, but I was like the ninth guy off the bench. And, okay. you know, I played a little bit of community college basketball. I was happy that I made the team, but I wasn't playing much. I think I got in like three games right. my freshman year or my sophomore year, <laughs> but I loved watching it. I loved yeah. to be in broadcasting and, and, and report about it and read about it. So when I'm in the middle of that time, I don't even think I, I've ever really said this publicly, but I bet you a movie thinking back now, like Hoop Dreams helped impact me to say, man, I love sports and telling stories. I got to go back to school here <laughs> and finish my degree because I want to work in broadcasting. I don't want to work at a hospital for the rest right. of my life. And it was all of that was taking place around that time where I went back to college, got my degree, worked in radio, then got to ESPN. And it all mm -hmm. probably started in that time frame when I had seen your guys' movies. So I don't know if it was a direct impact, but I guarantee you seeing a movie like that and seeing how stories could be told and how much mm -hmm. I love the game of basketball, both playing, even if it was pickup, but yeah. also covering the game. Yeah, I think it impacted me a lot. It's interesting that you start there because um, I had this question for you, man, because I, 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 we really want this. One of the things about the podcast is this is about telling everybody else's story, too. So we yeah. want to know the Jason Romano story. Let's go back to the beginning. You 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 were born in Rochester, New York, and but you grew up outside of Albany. And and so what what was that like? What was it like for you growing up as a kid and coming into your own? So I was a kid who um, grew up in a divorced home. My parents were divorced when I was five or six. So I didn't really have uh, a great relationship with my dad. Um, I've, I, my first book is about that relationship. It was very broken and very um, roller coastery, mm -hmm. if you will, up and down and up and down. Um, but I had a good childhood, really, when I think about it, because of my mom. And I know for a lot of us, it's our moms that that hold it together, yeah, right? That keep us going. And and for me, my mom was that person. She was the rock of the family. Her and my grandparents, um, because we know they're the best too. And my grandparents and my mom really held it together for me and my two brothers. Mm -hmm. um, I tell people I grew up uh, loving sports, like out of the right. room, right? Like when I was five or six, I started reading the sports page every morning. And as I got older, and my brother is also loving sports. Again, before the internet, it was ESPN. It was Monday night, football. you know, college hoops, <laughs> Monday night football, Sundays we watched the games, college football on Saturdays, baseball all throughout the summer, wow. and playing it and watching it. I mean, it was everything. We love sports. Mm -hmm. Sports in many ways was my God, I tell people, because I worshiped mm -hmm. it. It was mm -hmm. all I cared about. Uh, my brothers and I fought for that sports page as we got older <laughs> oh, yeah. because we wanted to see the box score right, right. the next day. You guys probably yes, remember those days. Yeah. I, I got to see what my guy Larry Bird yeah. did because I grew up a Celtics fan. Larry was my basketball hero, and my brother Chris grew up a Lakers fan, and Magic was wow. his guy. That's why I got that picture behind oh, me, really? Magic and Bird, because it reminds it. me of me and my brother. And so I don't know why we grew up rooting against the teams, you know, the teams that we each rooted for, but. Um, that began a rivalry, a friendly rivalry okay. in the house for me and my brothers for wow. years, but sports was it. Right. And so as I grew up, you know, I tell people my life wasn't that difficult, but I definitely went through trauma that I didn't even realize yeah. when I was younger because I didn't have my father right. around. He tried to right. be around, but that guy drank so much and uh, he, he became addicted to alcohol and it ruined his life for many, many, many years. Now, Fast forwarding, we're, we're reconciled now and our relationship is mm -hmm. good. It's not great, but it was a tough road for about 30 years with my father. And, um, you know, I didn't realize that that was the one thing that should have brought my dad and I together, which mm -hmm. was sports. You know, we both love sports, but in many ways, that's what tore us apart. Because when my mm -hmm. father watched sports, he was a very loud, <laughs> uh, in some ways, violent guy, um, especially wow. when he drank. And I'm not talking about like beating me and my brothers up, not that not that kind of violent. But he was, if his teams didn't do well, he was throwing beer cans against the wall. Oh, he okay. was throwing, I mean, oh, he yeah. was, it was bad. It was bad for many years. Um, so that's kind of, I tell people I had a great childhood and I really did. Um, but under underneath the surface, there was some some difficult things going so on. So listen, too. speaking of you, speaking of your brothers, 
how, how many brothers did you have and what type of relationship you, you grew up with them with? Yeah, because I have one older sister and one younger brother. I'm the middle kid. Okay. You see, my brother so, Chris, who's the Lakers fan, is the middle kid. I'm okay. the oldest. And I got a little younger brother named Damien and my middle brother Chris and then myself. So we grew up three boys in a household with a, a single mom, like I mentioned. And, you know, my mom had it. She had it rough. Yeah. Like she's working three jobs and trying to raise three boys. Like, are you kidding me? Uh, wow. Oh my gosh. Um, but like I said, my grandmother and grandfather were there and really helped kind of pick up the low while my mom was working. And it was good. We, you know, we fought like every kids, all kids do. And, uh -huh. you know, we both, we all love sports, but we were also very competitive. So we would compete right. at, at everything, right? Whether it was sports. I was going to ask you, did y'all challenge, challenge each other? Arthur, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> my brother, Chris, and I, I'm going to tell you a quick story. So he was the younger brother, although he developed sooner than I did. So at 10 years old, this kid's starting to grow a mustache. I mean, he is filling out and he was, I'm, I'm dead serious when I tell you this. And he was five foot eight in fifth grade wow, and he ended up man. being five foot 10. Right. But he ended up being five foot 10. That's what he is now. So he didn't grow a whole lot. He didn't grow a whole grade. lot. <laughs> But in fifth and sixth grade, we were battling and there were times in our backyard where we would play at the, in the, you know, we had a hoop in our backyard and we'd go out and shoot and we'd play one-on-one -on -one. and I was starting to beat him a little bit and he was getting mad. Oh. And one day I was scoring on him and I was more of a jump shooter outside kind of guy. And he was like a post and kind of take you inside a little bit. And I was just sitting out there draining threes. So one time my, my brother gets the ball and he comes in on me and I'm stopping him and I block his shot. He got so mad. He swiped at me and karate chopped me right in the throat. <laughs> Are you went, serious? I, I'm dead what? serious. I went down and I was probably 14, maybe 15. I right. went down, guys, and uh, I was down for the count for a while. And I was coughing what? and choking a little bit. And, <laughs> and he was laughing. He's like, that's what you get for trying to bring it into my house. And I'm like, ah, what's he's happening? Like, he's like, I got a concussion. I can't breathe. <laughs> here's here's oh the funny part, God. though, guys. That brother today is a pastor. Oh. <laughs> but Are he wasn't you serious? All, I am very serious, but he wasn't acting all pastoral back in the day when no, we were in no, high school. No, no, right. no. He had oh to get it out God. early. Oh, my gosh. We have a great relationship today, my brothers. Mm -hmm. But when we were kids, we loved each other. But, like, I'm sure you guys, too, like, you battle with your brothers and you compete yeah, with absolutely. your brothers. You compete for attention with your mom. I mean, you compete for attention with girls. All of those things when you're in high school yeah. and um, but yeah, as we got older, we're, we're good friends now still and, and best buds. And I'm so proud of both my brothers, but back then <laughs> it was a battle. Let's just say that. Which actually leads me to my next question is, is yeah. you're being the oldest. Yep. Where, where did the love of sports come from? Because see, I'm, I'm, I'm the younger brother. So I saw my brothers. I knew I, I fed off of their love. Where yeah. did the love of sports come from? Well, it certainly didn't come from my mom, um, but it came from my dad, <laughs> ironically, but it came from really my grandfather. So Ooh. like I said, I wasn't around my dad as much when we mm -hmm. were little, but my dad loves sports. Even to this day, our conversations center around who the next head coach of the Boston Celtics is going to be, because that's my dad's <laughs> team. That's my team. So all we do is talk about sports, but my dad's love of sports came from my grandfather. And my okay. grandfather was around a lot when we were little and, uh, you know, he died in 2007 and I miss him. But when we were kids, that's all we watched sports with him. He would explain to us situations and teach us the game. He was our coach in little league. He came to all of our games, never missed a game in high school. Wow. So yeah. that's really, I think, if I'm being honest, Will, where it came from was my grandfather, but also my yeah. dad. Um, I just wish that my dad didn't worship sports so much where he could have just let that go and just be a dad. Um, but he couldn't do it. But, uh, yeah, my grandfather was the one man. He passed that down to all of us. And, you know, I'm trying to pass that down to my daughter. I have one, one daughter right now and she loves sports too. Not like I do, but she loves it and watches it and plays it. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty fun. Love it. So you growing up, so you growing up in New York, I mean, you wasn't yeah. a Knicks fan. You know, I was upstate. So we were up in Albany, about two hours north of New York. And uh, my dad, like, like I said, my dad was a Celtics fan from like the 60s, Arthur. So, if you know, the Bill Russell days, right? And the, and the right. John Havlicek days. So they won title after title. My dad grew up in the 60s. So that was his team. Um, 
And then I just kind of adopted that from him. And so we became Ooh. Nick haters. I don't like using the word hater, but you know what I mean by that. <laughs> yes, if you're yes, a Celtics yes, fan, yes, you're, not yes. a, you're not a Knicks fan if you're a Celtics fan, right? Right. <laughs> That's right. That's Can't right. Be. That's Can't right. Be. So Boston was about equal distance to us where we lived as as New York City was. So I, we had a lot more Boston fans than you would think in Albany in the upstate New York area. So where's the Buffalo Bills at? So the Bills are are further west. So picture New York City on a map and then just go two hours directly north, and that's where I was. If you want to go from where I was to Buffalo, you got to go about six hours, five hours west. It's wow. over. Buffalo is over by Pittsburgh and Cleveland and Ohio. Buffalo is on the on the western part of New York State. Um, there's a lot of Bills fans in the town I grew up in as well. Um, I rebelled. I didn't root for any local team. I rooted for the, I root for the Cowboys. <laughs> that's been my team really? since I was yeah that's, the Dallas that's, Cowboys. That's been are my you team. Serious? You from New the York, Cowboys? man? <laughs> you a New Yorkin? I think Jason, I have. No. I have a. I have a rationale for this. So my dad, I think I rebelled against my dad because I saw how violent he was with football with the Giants. So he's a New York Giants fan, right? So that makes sense, New York Giants. And I was like, who's that team in the star that's playing the Giants and beating them? And my dad's like, that's the Cowboys. We don't root for them. I'm like, no, I think I want that team. (laughs) So I'm talking about the early 80s here. I stuck with the Cowboys, and to this day, I still root for them. I know when you said that, Boats grew out of his neck. His neck, he steamed (laughs) up. He turned around, looked at you like, that's right. oh, my gosh. He's like, boy, you better go to your room. (laughs) So so, so who, who does your daughter root for? So it's weird. My daughter did the same thing I did. So she doesn't root for any of the rivals. <laughs> they like father, like daughter. Seriously. My daughter, one day, we, she was five years old. And, uh, you know, she's 17 now. She just turned 17 a couple days ago. So she's, you know, growing up and doing great things. And it's it's a different stage of life when you got a teenage daughter. But when she's four or five, I'm watching football one Sunday She's daddy's girl. She comes down, daddy, what's that? I said, this is the Cowboys. And if you look at pictures of her when she's two or three or four years old, I have her in Tony Romo jerseys. I have her in cowboy jerseys. I was trying. I was trying. One day I'm watching a Cowboys game and she, uh, she sees the Cowboys and they're playing the Denver Broncos. And she goes, dad, who is that team that Dallas is playing against? I said, that's the Broncos, sweetie. She goes, Oh, I want to root for that team. I said, why? She goes, horses, dad. Horse is my favorite animal. I love horses. They got a horse on their helmet. And I said, Sarah, you root for the Cowboys, sweetie. She's like, no, dad. I'm rooting for the Denver horses. I said, oh. Hey, 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 AG, who who has some boats coming out of their neck now? (laughs) Yeah. He do. Right He's steaming it. Head turning. <laughs> oh so my look, gosh, look, look. Speaking of speaking of your die hard cowboys, yeah. Is Stephen A. Smith talking to you when he be saying them nauseating cowboy fans? I'm talking to you. I'm talking to so, you. <laughs> let me tell you a story about Stephen A. He is one of the best dudes I ever worked with when I was at ESPN. He really is. Really? But he genuinely cannot stand the Cowboys and those fans. That is not an ESPN persona. Like sh- that's how he whatever, feels. Yeah. yeah, that's how he feels off the air. Um, <laughs> he's not talking to me. Here's why he's not talking to me. Because I'm not a nauseating uh, fan who's screaming and yelling and telling people how great the Cowboys are every year. I'm a realist. I know that they haven't won anything in 26 years and that mm-hmm. they've won, what, two playoff games or three playoff games in, in a long yeah. time. So I'm not the guy who's who's saying, oh, Stephen A., you see how good we are? We're going to go to the Super Bowl. Yeah. That is not me. Uh-huh. I promise you, <laughs> that is not me. Are you optimistic about their season this year? I mean, I mean they, they start, off, they start off good. 25 years, Arthur. I mean, I guess, <laughs> I guess uh, I'm optimistic that if they're healthy, they have a good team. Like they have a lot of talent, but you guys know you played at higher levels than I did. Talent doesn't always win you games. You got to put right it about together. That. You got to have a good culture. Yeah, you, know, you have to have some luck go on your side. You have to have teams that you play make those mistakes. Yeah. Um, I think they can be pretty good, but I don't know. I'm not going to be this guy that says, <laughs> "Oh, 
there ain't nobody stopping them because, right, like right. Stephen A. says, they'll they're the Dallas Cowboys. They'll Cowboy. figure out a way to stop they themselves. They figure out a way. Yeah. They get in their way. They get in their own way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so, Jason, uh, let me ask you this, man. Big yeah. sports fan, obviously Cowboys. Yeah. You loving your Celtics? Which, yeah. by the way, we should talk a little bit about that too with Brad Stevens and all of that mix up and everything yeah. going on with him. But I gotta ask this, man. You and your brothers, man. The Romano brothers, what what was what was the nicknames y'all had growing up? Oh my gosh, nicknames. All right, All right. So I got good stories with this. So my middle brother Chris um was a huge Roger Clemens fan in the 80s. And if okay. you guys remember Roger Clemens, a baseball pitcher, his Absolutely. nickname was Rocket. The Rocket. Yep, Rocket Clemens. So my brother adopted that nickname, or his friends called him that when he was like 10 or 11. And remember, my brother at a young age, my brother Chris was a stud. Like he was playing varsity as a, as a freshman, sophomore on the football team, the baseball team, and the basketball team. Like he was he was right. the athlete, you know, in his class. Um, and he had that nickname, Rocket. So all of his friends called him Rocket. So Rocket was his nickname. Uh, my little <laughs> brother Damien, you guys will laugh at this. You know, the little brother, he always gets picked on. And he's always <laughs> like, you know, the the child that you know gets left behind, and and everybody's kind of, you know, you 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 pile on your little little brother. Well, yeah. one day, he was probably eight, seven, eight years old. We were at the house, and we were just being idiot kids, and we started calling him dumb. You know, his name is Damien. <laughs> we were like, oh, oh you're okay. dumb, dumb Damien. Well, my mom was not having that. Right, obviously. right. So I said, all right, well, he's not dumb then. He's going to be lum. He's lum, Damien. Ah! So we could get away with it. Right. Let me tell you guys, that nickname has stuck to this day for him. He is lum. And I have wow. no idea what it means. <laughs> People are like, why do you call him lum? I'm like, well, we used to call him dumb, and then we just changed it to lum. But it became like this really, like he wore it as a badge of honor. Wow. And that was, wow. yeah, that was his nickname through high school and in college and as he got older. So I still see him and call him Lum every so often. Um, and he asks. Obviously, and he, he, answers, likes, yeah, he knows I'm not calling him dumb anymore because he's, he's a smart kid. Um, so he had that. I really didn't have a nickname when I was younger. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I wanted to be, you know, like Larry Legend or, you know, Straw, like Daryl Strawberry. I was a big Mets fan. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have a nickname like that. I, I didn't have a nickname um, my, you know, my college roommate, my, my friend, Eddie, who I told you guys about when we went and saw hoop dreams, he used to call me Jay nice because, uh, he was, a, okay. he was a DJ okay. and he was Ed, he was Ed smooth in college. And I was Jay nice. Do you guys remember nice and smooth, the rap band? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. He, he's like, we're going to be nice and smooth. Jay, you be Jay nice and I'll be Ed smooth. And I'm like, all right. Um, so, <laughs> So I was Jay Nice for many years. He still calls me it when he sees me now. But this, I mean, we were 20 years old during those times. But that yeah. was the, probably the only real nickname I have. And then people call me j Row when I got to ESPN. Everybody has like a nickname at ESPN or um, Romano. And that, the last name is is very common, but not not a real good nickname. Um, but that's okay. Yeah. I like nicknames. So, so, right. so when we see the back of your jersey, it say Jay Smooth? It would say Jay Nice, actually. Jay Nice? Oh, okay. Jay Nice. It say Jay Nice on the back of his jersey. <laughs> and his jersey, nice. Eddie's jersey would be Ed Smooth. <laughs> hey, okay. I love it. I love That's it. it. That's, dope. That's dope. Yeah, he was a, uh, he, he was a DJ back in the, uh, in the early 90s, like a hip-hop DJ. So when wow. I was in college, um, I started, I mean, I, rem I would listen to hip-hop in the 80s, but when I got to college in the early 90s, that's when... I mean, Cypress Hill, Nice and Smooth, Dr. Ooh, Dre. I mean, all of these, that's when yeah. hip hop was blowing up, you know, even yeah. Tupac in those days. So we used to hear it every day because he was a DJ and he had the 1200 turntables and he was spinning spinning those uh, records every single day. So I would hear these songs every day. Ooh. And uh, Ooh. one day he just said, we're going to be nice and smooth, Jay. I said, all right, let's go. So, you can always tell somebody's era as soon as they start talking about what rap right. music they listen to. You're like, oh, I know what era you from. Oh, so yeah. let, me, let, me, let me ask you this, man. This, this, is, this is interesting because it's, you know, you play sports. What were some of the great playgrounds in your area? What were some oh, of the great God. basketball courts in your area? Well, there yeah. was only one because um, I grew up in the Albany area, but I only, I grew up in a really small town. I mean, we're talking okay. about 2,000 people. 
Everybody oh, wow. knew everybody. So everybody knew called, everybody. Yeah. Oh, you guys know about those towns. Everybody yep. knows everybody. Um, and they all know your business, good and bad. And that's <laughs> right. not always yep. a good thing. That's um, all right. That's but right. it was a little town called Ravina. And it's about 12 miles south of Albany. And it's a little, you know, little town that we, we had the uh, Mosier Park. You know, it has a big pool, like a park pool. And it had mm-hmm. two courts. And Can't that's where we court. played. Wow. From the time you're, I don't know, when I was 10, 11 years old, all the way till I was, till I moved to Connecticut. So probably 26, you know, we wow. would play summer leagues in that court. Wow. Uh, we would play pickup. I mean, I, I remember guys going in high school and college and playing pickup from six. To, I mean, you guys did this too. I know it from yep. five or six at night until they, until they turned off the lights, the lights. and yep. 11, 10, 11 o'clock at night. And you, in the middle of the summer when it's hot and humid, you just didn't yep. care. You brought you a couple care. extra nope. t-shirts and you sweat through them all and you kept playing. <laughs> yeah. that's right. And that's, that's what right. we did. And we played and you always wanted to keep, you always wanted to stay on a team. Like we played winners, right? So winners stayed on. Mm-hmm. So when mm-hmm. we played, you stayed on the court and I could, I was grateful when I was on those teams that played 10, 11 games in a row and we were just running it. And yeah. there was other times when, you know, you'd lose one or two games and you didn't play for another three games. Cause there was, you know, five or six teams waiting on the side. And yeah. uh, I love those memories though, man. I loved playing. Man. Uh, I didn't care who was watching. Uh, there was a lot of trash talk for a small town of people that weren't very good. If I'm being honest, right. guys, I mean, we were okay, mm-hmm. but you know, we, we knew when somebody who was going to play college ball was on those courts it's and weird. you kind of just sat there and watched them and you're like, okay, that guy's on a different level than all, all of us. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun. But it was fun. And we played for years on those courts. So Mosier Park, Ravina, New Mosier York. That was, that was the court. Mosier that was the court. Park. Yes. That was nice the court. Name. Yeah. yeah nice Mosier name. Park. Well, you already told us your, your, your favorite basketball player and the sports guy you looked up to was Larry Bird. I did. But where did the uh, media and broadcasting, why, why did you want to do that? Like, who did you see doing that? You know what I'm saying? Because I saw yeah. Isaiah Thomas go right. from the west side of Chicago to back-to-back NBA championship. And I thought I could do that same thing. Yes. And it just it's just so crazy that I had a camera following me for – for 70 some years about doing it but you know that that was he was like my he was like my my uh uh template if yes. you say yeah, yeah. so wh- who was that for you and where did that 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 come from that's a great question so i think early on you know probably in the mid 80s is when i i mean i i watched sports all the time so it wasn't just playing it but i watched it and i would have notebooks Ooh. and keep stats and i i was doing things at 14 and 15 that I didn't realize would actually help me get a job in broadcasting someday, but I was doing it because I just loved it. And so I would watch on TV, I would watch Howard Cosell when I'm going, you know, going way back to when we were all little kids, right? And so I I remember Howard Cosell and I I remember thinking, oh, he's the greatest broadcaster out there right now, right? I mean, so at that time it was Howard Cosell. Now, as you get a little older and you start watching ESPN and Mm -hmm. Sports Center. And guys yeah. like Dan Patrick and Keith Olbermann and Stuart mm-hmm. Scott and Rich yeah. Eisen and Bob Lee, Lee uh, yeah. all of these legends, Chris Berman, like those exactly. guys are the guys when you watch and you think, well, I don't know if I could ever be those guys, <laughs> but I love, I would love to do what they're doing someday. <laughs> right. You absolutely. Know? So that's kind of what I would, I would watch and see. And those were, if you want to call them my templates, Arthur, like those were the guys that I, I, I it's not even the guys. I just thought. How cool would it be to work at a place where all you have to worry about is sports? It's sports. <laughs> all, yeah, day right. yeah. all day long. All day long. And so yeah. at 17 in high school, I think about this now because my daughter's 17, I oh. knew that that's what I wanted to do. Now, I didn't know how to get there. I didn't right. know, you know that internships were important. I didn't know right. the importance of networking. There was no internet, you know, so I didn't right. know how you get a job. But I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I remember in my high school yearbook, class of 1991, guys, right? Class of 1991, mm-hmm. high school yearbook, mm-hmm. it says, my ambition is to become the greatest sports announcer since Howard Cosell. Now, wow. that didn't happen, but what? I got to achieve a dream that was something that I was only thinking about back in those days, back which was get days. to ESPN. That's right. Wow. So, 
Yeah. What stirred it? I mean, obviously, you said you saw Howard Corsell, but I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about going down the level when I actually was stirred it more tending toward that. Was it because you were done with sports in the sense of saying, I can't play it, but I love That's it so much. Question. I'm going yeah. to just this this going to keep me in the game. Mm -hmm. No, I think it was. Yeah, it was probably sometime my senior year of high school. Um, I thought I was better than I was. I probably was a little bit better than the coach thought I was. Um, I, I, I played every game, but I was like the seventh man, you know, the second guy off the bench. Mm -hmm. I would play maybe 10 minutes a game and score a couple, you know, four five, six points a game, something like that. And I'm realizing as I'm doing this, like, there is no way that I'm going to ever play college or pro ball. Now I did play a little community college. I, I elevated my game got better after my senior year enough to play and make a community college team. Mm -hmm. But I still knew I wasn't going to play pros. So mm -hmm. what's the next best thing, guys? Well, you can talk about it. You can talk you can about it. it. <laughs> right. and, and get paid for it. <laughs> and get paid for it. Now that part, I didn't know if it was ever going to happen, but it did. But Will, I got to tell you, that was where I think the rubber hit the road for me. And I was like, all right, I, I don't know a whole lot of other things that I really want to do. You know, a lot of people yeah. go to college and they'll think, you know, they go to college and ah, maybe I'll try this and I'll learn some things here and yep. there. Yeah, I went to college for the sole purpose to get a broadcasting degree and work in broadcasting. And I did Damn. that my, my, my community college year and I did it uh, when I got my four year degree. My sole goal was to do that. And I'll tell you, when I got to college, Will, and I went to a community college uh, over near Buffalo, by the way. I know Arthur was talking about Buffalo. I went to a community college out there for two years mm -hmm. and I, I hosted my own radio show. I was broadcasting the community college basketball games, high school football games. And I was 18 years old in college, my freshman year doing this. Now I was terrible. Don't ever dig up those cassettes because it was bad, <laughs> really bad. But I realized when I was doing this, I want to do this. Like, this is so much fun. Are you kidding me? Mm. And so I took classes in college. Obviously, you take your, your main classes, your math and your English that you have to take. But all of my electives were broadcasting, um, radio announcing, mm. everything that I could learn about this industry in college. Yeah. And so I got my two-year degree. I took those two years off, like I told you guys, saw Hoop Dreams, and then mm -hmm. went back to school. And again, when I went back, I realized as I was going back, I don't want to be in any other business but broadcasting. So yeah. I went back, got my four-year degree, and I did the same thing my last two years. I, I enthralled myself into the radio sh uh, station, the TV station, mm -hmm. anything that I could do. To, I hosted my own sports talk show in 1996. I mean, it, in college. Wow. So again, it was it, I wasn't getting paid and it wasn't very good, but I was doing what I loved. And I said, maybe someday I'll mm -hmm. get paid for this. But either way, I want to do this for as long as God will let me. And I was grateful because I got out of college in 97. So I took a couple years off. So I graduated in 97 and got a Where was job. That from? You graduated from. So if you know, the New York school systems in college, there's a SUNY school system, state university of New York. And so they have Ooh. SUNY Albany, SUNY Buffalo, SUNY Geneseo, okay. SUNY Oswego. I graduated from a college called SUNY New Paltz and New okay. Paltz is about one hour North of New York city. So we had a wow. lot of city kids that were at New Paltz, but they had what I called was the best four year broadcasting program in the state. And so I went really? there because it was cheap because I was a state school and I didn't have a lot of money. And because they had a broadcasting program. Do you remember graduated. the teachers? Do you remember the I teachers don't. who taught it? <laughs> I don't? don't remember. You no, know, it's funny. My mind was so focused on graduating. I really? didn't. And this is what I say. I didn't, I didn't know any better. I should have gotten to know the teachers. I, I remember my teacher in my freshman and sophomore years, Mr. Keeler, and he was a big influence on me, Stephen Keeler, early on to just say, you know what, you're 18 and 19, but go for this, go for it. Don't, right. don't worry about anybody else telling you, you can't do it. Try it. See if you can do this. Uh, and then when I got to my, my last couple years, I don't remember any of the teacher's names, but I do remember my focus was one, one thing and one thing only get my degree. Well, I want to just I'm, graduate. I'm going to tell you the reason I'm going to tell you the reason why I asked that is because yeah, the type of job that you were trying to do and you're in the school, you said you figured, you know, it was a cheap 
you know, but it was you you was learning and getting it. I was wondering if that if you was able to because you didn't know any resources of how to go out and you know, if, if the teacher knew knew somebody at a at a yeah. you know and the then try to turn thing. yeah, and try to turn you on that yeah. way to them where you can get your foot in the door or say something good about, you know, what Jason, oh, I had this guy in my class, he's he's about to graduate. You know what I'm saying? So where how was your did you just stumble upon somebody and they said <laughs> I got a good story here for you because when I got out of college I mean, I was dating a girl too, and there's always, you know, a girl comes in the picture. And so my focus was school during the week, broadcasting, and then go see my girlfriend. And so I really wasn't um, even about that college life and about that time right. of getting to know people. I just wanted to get over, get it, get it through it and get it done. Mm -hmm. When I graduated in 97, I got a job and I was working at some marketing firm. It had nothing to do with broadcasting. It was just a job to make mm -hmm. money. And I didn't want to go back and live with my parents or my grandparents because um, I had done that and it, I needed to get out and be on my own. So I found an right. apartment and I needed a job. So I was working at that marketing place. But in the back of my mind, I said, I need to work in broadcasting. So one day around this time, a long time ago, 1997, I got my resume and I printed about 10 copies of it. And I said, I'm going to drive in Albany because I went back home to every radio station in the Albany area. And I'm going to walk in and I'm going to hand them my resume and I'm going to tell them I'll do anything to work for them. I don't even need to get paid. And I meant that I just wow. needed to get into a radio wow. station to get experience. The very first station I went to WGY 810 AM news talk radio in mm -hmm. Albany, New York. I walked in and I saw the lady at the front desk. And I handed her my resume and I said, hi, you don't know me. My name is Jason. You know, I was 22 at the time, right? 22 years old. And I went in and I said, uh, you don't know me. Uh, I just graduated college. I love broadcasting and I would love to work for you guys. And you don't even have to pay me. If you have any openings, I'd love to chat with you. Here's my resume. And we talked for a few minutes with that, that woman and mm -hmm. Uh, she was just a secretary, right? So right. she was the, she, I always say, I don't even remember her name because I didn't really get to know her, but if she had taken my resume guys, right. And just ripped it apart and threw it in the mm -hmm. garbage after I walked out, I have no idea how my journey would have went, but she didn't. Wow. She took the resume. Apparently I impressed her enough. She took it back to the, one of the gals who worked in the promotions department at the radio station. And she said, hey, this, this, young, this young man, Jason, came. He might be somebody that could help you guys. So the next day, I got a call from this woman uh, telling me that they didn't have an opening, but they'd love to have me come volunteer. That was the word they used okay. at their station in their department. And I said, absolutely. I didn't even give it a second chance because I just wanted to get in the door, guys. Right. And you know, once you get in the door, then it's on me. But getting in the door is not always on me. That's on somebody else opening that door getting and saying, door. come on yeah. in. I got in the door and I made the most of it. I, I just spent three months that summer in 97 uh, learning, meeting everyone, um, and really learning how to be a producer in radio, mm. which is what I ended up pretty much doing for most of my career at ESPN was, was being a producer. And I learned it all by volunteering. I never asked for a dime from them. I just asked for their time and their availability wow. to use their, their facilities and to meet people. And it led to my first job three months later with them. Now, guys, my first job, it paid me $15,000 a year. That's one five. And there were no benefits and there were no, there was no overtime. It was salaried. That's about six bucks an hour when you do the math, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I didn't care. I would have done it for a dollar an hour. I just, I was just so glad that I got a job in the business and I could have, I'll work three other jobs if I have to figure out a way to support myself, you know, right. grocery stores right. or Walmarts or whatever, but I needed to be in broadcasting. And I was just so glad that they gave me a chance. And I did Ooh. that for three years. And then I left to go to ESPN and that's where the career started to really take off. So, yeah, but it was just one of those opportunities, just one of those opportunities. And, 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 and what's interesting, man, what I'm loving about hearing your story is because I'm always trying to relate sports 
and and our and and work ethic to everything yeah. that we kind of do. It's right. it's, yeah. it's interesting that you came in and said, you know, I'm gonna do this. Y'all don't even gotta pay me. It's hard to get young athletes to get up in the morning to do what they say they want to do. But here you are. Mm-hmm. I'll do this for free. So this journey, man, you you put in the time. You put the three years in. You learn the rope. What was the process at this point getting to ESPN? Did you do the same things? You went and pulled out all your resumes and slapped it on the desk with this another young lady at, at ESPN that you it wasn't told like that. her the story? No, I'll tell you what happened was a wonderful invention called the internet happened. And in 1998, so this is only about six months after I had gotten hired, I was perusing the internet one day and there was a job opening for a radio producer position Mm -hmm. at ESPN Radio, the network in Bristol, Connecticut. And I thought, wow, that job, other than sports, because I wasn't working in sports at the time, I said, that job, I have all of those skills. Now I don't have the experience, but I have the skills, the experience. They needed like three or four years experience, um, to work at ESPN. I had four months, right? I had six months of experience, professional experience, but I applied because in the, in those days, and even today too, it doesn't hurt to apply. You just upload your resume, you fill out the info and you click apply and you kind of just walk away. And I remember I did that and I, I, Hadn't been married yet, but my girlfriend at the time, who I who is now my wife, I went over to her and I said, "Hey, I just went on the internet and just found this amazing job in Connecticut, and I applied for it." I said, "I don't think I'm going to get it, but I just want you to know I applied for it." And at the time, she was like, "Well, that's great. Keep me posted." And so, the ESPN called me after I hit apply on that internet about a, two weeks later, and wow. they said, "Would you come to Bristol, and would you, you know?" come find out about this job. I said, absolutely, let's go. So I drove out there with my friend, John. Yeah, but here's what happened, guys. I went out there and I was a kid in a candy store, right? I'm at ESPN, the Mecca. Right, right. And I'm interviewing with a guy named Len Weiner. And Len, the second I sit down for the interview, he shakes my hand. He goes, you know, we're not going to hire you, right? And I said, "Uh, (laughs) well, it's nice. It's nice to meet you too, Len. No, he goes, we're not going to hire you. You don't have the experience. He's like, are you are you gonna get married someday? I'm like, yeah, maybe. I have a girlfriend. He's like, you're not gonna move here until after you're married. He's like, but I'm. I wanted you to come here because we wanted to meet you because you have potential, and we're really interested in um, kind of just stockpiling what you would call um, potential people to hire down the road. Mm. And I was like, okay. Um, so he's like, I'm sorry, there's no job for now, but I'll take you on a tour. And I was like, this is great. If I never got the job at ESPN, <laughs> it still would have been the gr- greatest day ever, right? Because right, it's ESPN. Right. That's right. right. He's like, this is great. Let's go. Um, but I go home and I just go about the rest of my the rest of my life, right? So what happens in those two years? I get married. Um, you know, I'm moving up in the ranks in the, the local radio circuit. In April of 2000 the same job is back on that same website, back on that wonderful invention called the internet. And so I saw it again and I'm like, let me apply again and see what happens. So I applied for the job and I went home that day and my wife and I, you know, we had just gotten married and I said, honey, I I applied. Remember that job a couple of years ago, that ESPN thing? She's like, yeah. I said, well, the same job opened up. I'm applying for it again. So just be prepared because I'm getting it this time. And I, Mm. I, 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 no, hold on. I said that facetiously. I did not really think I was going to get the job. (laughs) I was just trying to like, I guess, um, mess with my wife a little bit. You know, like we just got married, get ready. We're going to be moving to Connecticut. But I wasn't even trying to psych. You weren't even trying to psych yourself up. Like I didn't think I, I, again, I was just happy that they called and I went out there, but here's what happened, Arthur. When I went out there the second time, two years later, I could tell this is, this is more serious. Like they didn't say we're not hiring you when they walked in, they were like, tell us about your experience, this and that. It was a lot more serious. And I remember walking back into the house after I came home from Connecticut and interviewing with them. And I said to my wife, I'm like, there's a shot here. I said, I know how hard it is to get at ESPN, but there's a lot better chance now than there was two years ago. Just be prepared. And so my wife, who is so wonderful, said to me, at the time I was making $24,000 guys. I mean, that's what radio was paying. My wife said to me, she's like, if we, if you think we're going to move to Connecticut for your ESPN dream, they better pay you 
enough for us to live. Mm-hmm. I said, well, mm-hmm. what are they going to pay us? She's like, they have to pay you $38,000. <laughs> and that's not, you know, it's not a crazy right. number, but right. that's not. the number she gave me, guys. And we had just gotten married. So I wasn't about ready to get divorced, you know, six months after I got married. Here. Right. She says $38,000 and they got to pay for us to move to Connecticut from oh. New York. I said, all right. So I get a call and ESPN calls me back and they say, listen, guys. All right, listen, Jason, we are, uh, we're very interested in hiring you, but it's down to you and it's down to one other person. So it's me and one other person. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I kind of look at it as both, right? Like, you know, you're in the final two, but you also know there's a 50% chance you might not get hired here now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I knew that at least if I got down to the final two, that I knew I, I potentially someday could get there. Right. Cause that Mm. clearly they were interested. Yep. So I go back to my wife. She she reminds me of the 38,000. And I said, all right, well, I guess we wait and we see what happens. I get a call, guys. This is the honest to God, true story. And the guy from ESPN says, Jason, guess what? We want to hire both you and the other person. So wow. we'd like to hire get you and bring you to ESPN. They never do that, by the way. In 17 years, I've never seen this happen. They said, what? we love you. We love the other guy. His name is Paul. We want to hire both you and Paul. I said, great, I'm in, let's go. And then he's like, well, don't you want to know how much we're offering you? And I was like, (laughs) yeah, I I think I, I think I do. He goes, our salary, and I kid you not when I say this, he goes, our salary is $38,000 a year. I said, "Uh, that works. I'll take it. And he's like, we'll also move you to Connecticut. We'll pay for your your transportation. I said, sign me up. I'm good. Let Let's go. What? And uh, I went back and told my wife that night, and she said, "Well, are they paying you what?" You, I said they had to pay you. I said, "Right on the nose, honey." And she started crying. She's like, oh, "Man, wow. why didn't I say forty thousand? Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes. So that was how I got to ESPN. And I tell people that is not how most people get to ESPN. You either know someone, or you go through an internship, or you have a connection. I knew no one. But I had gone in 98 and they had me on their list and they remembered me. And I went back two years later and they hired me. I was going to ask you, did they remember you? Did you see the same guy? Right. Was he same right? people. That's the, that was the key, guys. The same people who were doing the hiring in 98, minus one or two, obviously. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, in 2000, were the same people. Now, here's wow. the difference. In 98, I interviewed with one person, that guy, Len, who mm-hmm. told me I wasn't going to get hired. In 2000, when I went out there, I interviewed with like four or five different people. Mm. And one of them, the entire interview was a sports trivia knowledge interview. Like he just wanted to know if I knew about, yeah, he didn't care about anything else other than do you know sports? So he started quizzing me and he started asking me about what was happening in the sports world. And I had to, I guess, impress him enough to know that I like, you know, I I pay attention. I know what I'm talking about. And that was that was big for me because I I mean like I told you guys I was watching sports since I was seven years old so that yeah. useless sports knowledge that I had as a kid actually helped me in some ways get a job at ESPN right. So. right that's crazy you got your that, that's like a hoop dream like you get the money that that your wife that y'all asked for and mm-hmm. they're gonna pay for y'all to move like you gotta yeah. be you got at this time you got to be on like cloud 39 40 somewhere man like damn my life has just changed. You have no idea. It was, uh, that was my hoop dream. I tell people, and by the way, now that I can look back 21 years later, that opened up so many doors. Honestly, if, if I never get to ESPN, I'm not talking to you guys, I'm just being honest here. I'm not getting a chance to hang out with you guys on your show. I'm, I'm certainly not writing books and I'm certainly well, not in a position where I could have left ESPN mm. to go into whatever I decided I wanted to go into. ESPN gave me so many blessings and opportunities. I mean, even wow. little things like Disney owns ESPN, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're an employee of ESPN, you get free Disney World tickets. So guess what I took my daughter <laughs> to right. every year? Disney right. World. So yes. that, kid, that kid for eight straight years went to Disney World when I hadn't go to Disney World till I was you know, married right, right. Right. for eight years in a row. And that doesn't happen if I don't work at ESPN. So it, it's not just the, the blessings for me, but it was all of these cool opportunities and experiences and meeting my sports heroes, people like yeah. Emmett Smith and Daryl Strawberry, working with people who were my heroes as kids. It was wow. incredible. It was incredible. So 
it was without a doubt. And I haven't ever heard it put that way, but that is exactly what it was, Arthur. It was my hoop dream. It, it was, was my hoop, hoop dream. dream. Wow. And we want to keep it there because now you know, it's, it's got this legendary 17 year career. <laughs> yeah. But let's, let's go to day one. Oh, you I hired. Day one. You hired. <laughs> you hired. Like, what you, what, what you producing? What was right. that? What was that like day one? You walk in the building. Is it real? Is it unreal? Where you at? It, it was a disaster. Here's why. <laughs> Cause I had, you know, we were still living in New York. So they had put me up in like a hotel for a, a month and then we had to find our own place here in Connecticut. So I had left my wife in New York and driven out to the hotel in Connecticut. And I was going to be dressed to the nine on day one, guys. I mean, you want to look good your first day, right? Right, right. I go that night getting ready for bed and I go to lay out my clothes for the next day. And I left all of my nice clothes back in New York. So all I had was sneakers, jeans, and a golf shirt. And that's what I wore my first day. And I remember <laughs> walking in that first day, so excited, right? That I'm working oh. at ESPN, meeting everybody who's kind of taking you around and introducing you and onboarding yeah. you to all of these places. And they're saying, and I'm apologizing to all of them. I'm so sorry that I'm wearing this. This is, this is not how I normally dress, you know? And right. they all said, don't worry about it. This is how we all dress here. Anyways, jeans, t-shirts and sneakers. And what? I was like, okay. I fit in, but that's not the impression that I was trying to make on my first day. It's day, right, so right. It, it was, it, I look at it as a disaster, but in, in, in all honesty, it was, it was like that first time. It was like your first day ever walking into Disney world or Disneyland or something like that. Right. Mm. Where you're looking around and you're just in awe of everything you see. And I remember walking in the hallways and walking past probably Dan Patrick or Keith Olbermann or one of those guys and saying, mm -hmm. I work with this guy. This like guy. they're paying me to be a <laughs> colleague with that guy. With that guy. Right. I, was, I was watching this dude on TV. <laughs> right. I mean, I bought their books and I was a big show fanatic that was on Sunday nights, you know, the big show with Dan and Keith. And now I'm getting paid to work with them. And that was pretty surreal. That was pretty surreal. It yeah. got better along the years of, of that kind of like that shine, that new car smell, if you will, wearing off. But I can tell you in 17 years, there probably wasn't one day where I didn't walk into that place and be like, I can't believe I get to work here, that wow. they're paying me enough wow. money to support my family to come work here. I didn't, I never lost that. Even in the moments when you're not having a good day or it's tough at, at work or your, your, your colleagues driving you nuts or your boss is not getting along, whatever, I still said, wait a minute, we're still working in the toy department of sports broadcasting. Of sports broadcasting. We're right. in sports. Like this yes, is the toy yes. department. We get to play in the toy department every single day. It's not day. serious here, guys. I, I understood that and was grateful for that every day. I really was. Because I understood that it wasn't, serious it was sports right. and we had to be the best that we could be you're at the best sports broadcasting place you can be but it was still sports mm. it was still sports so but i loved it man that's amazing. crazy that is amazing <laughs> i mean just to go to just i mean so let me ask you when was the first time you met Stuart scott so Stuart, i can't tell you the exact time but i, I mean the exact day but i can tell you a couple Stu scott stories so in the early days of my broadcasting career at ESPN, um, I worked at ESPN Radio. So I was a radio producer. Okay. And I worked on a show called Game Night on ESPN Radio. Mm -hmm. And it was on at like 7 o'clock at night, national radio. So it was on all around the country. And I was the producer for that show. Mm -hmm. And usually around 9 o'clock at night, we would call Sports Center, the TV side, and we would say, hey, can one of your anchors come over and do a little broadcast hit with us on the radio to promote their show. And that was usually the 11 o'clock sports center. Mm. I'm, I'm talking East coast time here. So the 11 o'clock sports oh. center, nine o'clock or so the anchor would come over and it was either rich Eisen or Stuart Scott that would come over every day for about a year because that was their show. And so Stu would come into the studio and they would, you know, we would, we wouldn't even talk about what was coming up on sports center. It was more of just, kind of like what we're doing. He would come in the, in the studio and my hosts, Chris and Chuck would say, what's up, Stu? How you doing? Hey, I'm good. How are you? And they would just start talking. And I just Ooh. remember Stu being just this cool cat. 
that's how I, yeah. re I remember him just being like a guy who was like, I'm Stuart Scott and I'm having fun here every day. And, and that wow. was what it was like. Now, later on, guys, after he contracted cancer, and obviously we're talking about someone who's passed now, RIP Stuart Scott, but later on in his life, I saw this fighter who had lost a lot of weight and, and certainly mm -hmm. this guy who was um, battling for his life never let that get in the way right. of his broadcasting and what he did on air. And so he would come in and I remember working on Sunday NFL countdown and we would be in this big room watching all the games on, on Sundays in the NFL season. And, you know, there was some heavy hitters in that room. I mean, Chris oh. Berman and Tom Jackson and Michael Irvin and Chris Carter and Chris Mortensen, like all of these ESPN NFL guys were in this oh. room. So we would we would be watching games and right about 5:30 every Sunday Stuart Scott would walk in cuz wow. he'd get ready for the late sports center. So he'd walk in, everybody would look at him and go, "Stu!" And like 25 people all at once saying "Stu" and he he'd just be like, "What's up guys?" He'd come in, he'd sit right in the front row next to Chris Berman and he mm -hmm. would watch NFL games until the, the games were over. So but that was why he was battling while he was battling cancer, guys. And yeah. I'll never forget, this will be my last thing on Stu. The day he died, I, I'll never forget that day. It was January of 2015. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, at that time I was working um, on the NFL project at ESPN. And Stu hadn't been on the air for, you know, nine months before that. He was, you know, he was fighting, yeah. but he also he knew fighting. that it was coming to an end. And we get into work that morning and my boss tells me, to uh you know don't don't post anything don't get anything up on social media don't do anything with the nfl uh until i tell you and he never did that and i was like that's mm. weird why would he say that and then like an hour later he comes in he, he goes you're about to watch on tv but Stu just passed and we were all bummed you know it was obviously a really hard day for anyone who worked at espn yeah, but, yeah. but for the people that worked with him but i just remember how unbelievably proud I was to be at ESPN that day and watch how people honored him, yeah. you know, and the legacy that he left. And then all you had to do was go on social media that day and president Obama was tweeting about him. Michael Jordan was sending press re press releases about Stuart Scott. They were having moments of silence at the playoff games in the NFL that day for Stuart Scott. And I'm like, this guy is a sports broadcaster who I had the privilege to work with. But think about, you don't realize when you're inside those walls every day, the global impact that ESPN has until, mm -hmm. unfortunately, it's kind of like a funeral, right? You don't realize the impact until the person's gone. Stu Scott's impact on that place was enormous because of the fact that it touched so many, I mean, he was, he was the first prominent African-American voice Vo that yeah young african-american inner city kids could relate to like too yeah when he was and on, that was a big deal right you guys probably would be able to speak to he that was better my than favorite i, I mean and right. he was my favorite that's why i had to bring him up and because i'm i want to i want to live what you what you felt seeing him every day i want to live that through you so i had to bring that up and and talk <laughs> about him because he was my favorite i mean and yeah. he didn't seem like it just seemed like that was the true authentic him. Like when the cameras was off, like he was still cool and laid back and he would and he would talk like that. Like yes, it wasn't that, nothing was forced. Nope, that was him. That was re it was really him and what was cool is that he had these relationships which you don't realize when you're walking around ESPN, those are your colleagues, but at right. you know, when you look back you realize, oh, Stu Scott was was friends with Michael Jordan. Right, right, and I know right. they were connected at North Carolina. They both went to North Carolina, but they were friends. Like he would just be like, "Yo, what's up, MJ?" That was real, and it was like, "Wait, Dang. you know, you don't realize the connections." And like I said, when President Barack Obama is tweeting about the loss of Stuart Scott, somebody you work with, you realize that's a big deal. Like that's how big of an impact he had on so many. And uh, his speech, if you ever want to get, you know. Oh, I remember that speech. And emotional. Go to YouTube, pull up the Stuart Scott speech from the ESPYs in 2014, and it will. You'll want to run through a wall after watching that. So, yeah, I think that's that's what's been so amazing, uh, just about ESPN as a whole. Um, it's it's like you said earlier. I mean, 
they're in our living room. I mean, they're like an extended member of our family. But what's yep. what's 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 amazing is is that you're behind the scenes. Right. On, nobody on knew who all. I was. Right. Nobody knows right. who you were, but but you're 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 sitting back there like giving guidance and 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 you know pumping stuff in people's ears and keeping yep. it moving. And what 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 was that like? Having to talk to those kind of guys to give them directions of Stuart Scott, Chris Berman, Dan Patrick, even Stephen A. What what was that experience like? I remember. I, I want a two shot on Stuart. On Stuart. Okay, get out. Okay, go, go back. I want a one shot. Go in closer. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not even that. It's Stu. We're going to the highlights of this game next. Like you're not just saying I want the look of the shot. You're talking to the guys who are on the show and telling them where they're going next. Where they're going so, next. Wow. And they're following you. And I didn't do that a lot with Stu at all mm -hmm. much, but you know, working with Dan Patrick, working with Bob Lee, the legend, Ooh. working with Mike and Mike, you know, wow. I learned early on if you didn't go in there with confidence, even if you were a producer, and it, you always remembered in the back of your mind that they were the star. Right. So my job was to make them look good. That's what you wanted to do. But they also you had to go in with with sort of a presence about yourself to say, all right, I know where we're going on this show. Here's where we need to go. And here's what you need to do to get us there. Mm. And they would. And, and, and when you did that. You know, you had to earn that trust, but right. they respected you a heck of a lot more if you weren't that impressed with them. You know, if you're that, oh my gosh, I'm I'm working here with uh, Dan Patrick, guys. This is amazing. Dan, could you maybe go to this topic next? They're just gonna they're gonna roll all over you if you do that. Mm. If you go in there and you stand firm and you say, guys, I really think we shouldn't go here, or I really do think we should go there, and you express your opinion and you do it confidently, that's when they know that okay, I trust that guy. He cares about what he's doing. I want to I want to get behind that guy. And, how did you learn? You know, how, how did you how did you do that? Did you did you go in being wanting to be that way, or or did you have to learn to do that? You have to learn because the personalities are different too. You mm -hmm. know, some people want to be told every step of the way where to go and what to do, and right. others just want to hear, you know, give me the next four things we're doing, and mm -hmm. then kind of just give me a little nudge to get there, but I don't need to be handheld. Uh -huh. every single time and so you kind of learn your personalities i think when you work like i think with bob lee you know bob lee started at espn like the third day espn ever came in existence yeah. in 1979 yeah. right and so i was working with bob for about five years on a show called outside the lines and mm -hmm. bob one of my was, favorite shows yeah it's a great show right in fact outside the lines was probably birthed from a movie like hoop dreams right it was sort of yeah. behind the scenes and and you know real life and tackled some tough issues yep. outside the lines was a tough show to do, but Bob, you know, early on, you're like, that's Bob Lee. You don't want to mess up. But once you work with Bob long enough, you develop a rapport, you develop a, uh, you know, a friendship, but also a trust factor with each day when you come in with Ooh. ideas, with topics. And I remember Bob once told somebody who related to me, they said, that Romano kid, he's good. I'm glad he's on our show. When you mm -hmm. hear Bob Lee say that, that's like Michael Jordan saying, you know, that that Damn. guy right there, you know, that Gates kid, he's pretty good. Yeah. I, I like him. That's what it's like. And you hear Bob Lee say that, and you're like, I, I right. must be doing so I must be doing something right. 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 And you want to run through a wall for that guy. That's that's what's so amazing, too, because I I, I will admit, man, I, when I was coming up in college, ESPN, you was just looking for the highlights. Mm. But when I got out of college, the show that really changed how I started, just like, man, ESPN is actually giving news, was Mike and Mike. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. like that show, mm -hmm. like, like I, I will admit, I was one of them guys, like, I can't believe these dudes are splitting up. Why, why is the show <laughs> ending? Like, that was, that was me, because mm -hmm. that was the show that really turned me on to, like, like it to me, it counterpoted news rate sports news radio in a sense. Like I hadn't seen anything, but but you you're like the catalyst on that show. 
Like what? What would your role? Let me correct you, Will. I was a catalyst. I wasn't the catalyst. I was one of <laughs> many amazing producers who worked on that show. But I do appreciate the way you you said that. But yeah, I was on that show for a couple of years. It changed, but it changed the the game in sports radio. Did, like, what right? was it like working, like developing a show like that? Because it it became more than just highlights. This was like in your face. They was telling yeah. stories. They was giving, yeah. and this was like on the spot kind of stuff. Well, here's the thing about Mike and Mike. So I'm glad you asked about that show because I got to work on Mike and Mike. That was, I didn't get there when I was telling you my story. That was the very first job I ever had at ESPN mm. was working on Mike and Mike. But mm. I tell people when I first started working on that show, it had only been on for four or five, six months. So nobody knew who Mike and Mike was when I first started working on it, but I loved yep. it. It was a morning radio show yep. on a national level talking about sports in an era when Howard Stern was dominating and then your local morning show would dominate in the, yep. in the local area. You know, there was not a, a national morning sports show that was on until yep. Mike and Mike really came on. Now, they also had to be good at what they did. Mm. or else that show would have just crumbled and they were great at what they did not only great they are now hall of famers uh yeah. broadcasting hall of famers because of what they did and that show was on for almost 18 years 19 Damn. years a long long time and i like to tell people that was the first show i worked on and this is the truth it was also mm. the last show i worked on at espn wow. so i bookended my career on mike and mike when I got Ooh. there, there were three people who worked on the show. When I left, there were 23 people who worked on the show <laughs> because it was a much bigger deal 17 years later. It was on television. It was on radio. It was digital. It was social. It was podcast, everything. So they had a large staff and a ton of more resources that Mike and Mike were dealing with when I was there on the back end of my career than Ooh. when I was there earlier. But they were great. I tell people, Mike and Mike, we're talking about Mike Greenberg, who was exactly like he is on the air, off the air, and mm -hmm. Mike Golick, who is the former football player, who is exactly yeah. like he is on the air as he is off the air. Yeah. Those guys yeah. um, were family people, great fathers, great husbands. They cared about their job and they were really good at it. But when the when the when the show ended, they went right home to their families and they took care of wow. their kids and watched their kids grow up. And so. Mm. I respected the heck out of that because when I saw them do that, I was like, all right, when I become a dad, I know that someday I don't want to just have work dominate my life. I want to be able to be a good dad, especially because I didn't have a good dad. And I saw Mike and Mike early on before I became a dad and watched them. And I was like, I want to be like that. So they had a bigger influence on me than a lot of people think, not just because of how great they were on the air, but because mm -hmm. of how great they were off the air. Yeah. Now, see, I kind of picture, I kind of picture um, ESPN like um, Barry Gordy and Motown, like, and I'm and, I, and I'm getting to this. Okay, Barry Gordy. I mean, Barry Gordy used to have all his artists come inside the studio, and they all used to, you know, play their song, what they working on, what they working on. I'm thinking that there is a competitiveness with other producers at ESPN about shows. Sure. So you know what I'm saying? ESPN, like, you know, get everybody in the in the room, be like, okay, what show you got today? What what show? Uh we yeah, we work Mike and Mike. Uh what show you got today? Uh NFL countdown. And then they go in there, like, <laughs> who going does the show get the ratings and all of this? Like, is that com is there competitiveness in producing these shows with other Absolutely. producers in the in yes, the sir. ESPN family? Absolutely, uh, Look at that. Arthur. There is because because uh if I was working one day on Outside the Lines, which mm -hmm. I did, that show was probably seventh in the pecking order, in mm. my opinion, of what people thought was an important show. You know, it was always Sports Center, it was always the NFL, mm. Monday Night Football, and then shows like, um, you know, First Take with Stephen A. and Skip yeah. back in the day, and Mike and Mike and shows like that. And then there was Outside the Lines. So if hey, I would can't go forget, in, hey, you can't forget. I'm not gonna let you forget cold pizza. Cold pizza. No, <laughs> Look at Will. That's right. Oh, boy. That's, That's right. right. Man, you can't forget cold pizza, man. 
cold pizza turned into first take. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. That's good memory by you. Um, yeah. So those shows, and by the way, cold pizza was one of those that were really at the bottom of the barrel. I mean, they were on ESPN, so they were important shows, mm -hmm. but you always felt like you were fighting for the guests that you wanted to have on and the topics and for eyeballs and for approval by mm -hmm. the bosses. So you would try to do things you know, we want to say, I had a great show today on Outside the Lines. It's like, yeah, I didn't see it. I saw Sports Center, And it's like, <laughs> no, watch our show. And <laughs> right. so, so the competitiveness was definitely there, I think, to not only to get on the bigger shows, but right. to also have people watch what you were doing on maybe some of the lesser shows. Because I'm telling you guys, you know this, e even on the lower, lesser shows, those producers were amazing, like top-notch producers. It's yeah. ESPN. You're not yep. you're not getting second fiddle people here. And so mm -hmm. you needed to really bring your A game every day. And that's what we felt like, but a lot of it was about approval and you know, we called it respect, but it's not respect. It's approval and and an acknowledgement from your bosses and your superiors mm -hmm. that they saw your show and you're doing a good job. Now, I then got to work on Sunday NFL Countdown, which was one of the top shows with a lot of resources. Everybody watched it. I got to work on Mike and Mike, same thing. And, cool. uh, you know, it was it was great to be on those shows too. But yeah, we were competing, of course. behind. And, and honestly, <laughs> don't let the anchors ever tell you, the on-air people, that they weren't competing either because they were. They all wanted to be the best sports center anchor, mm -hmm. NFL anchor, play-by-play -play guy. Yeah. And honestly, I would say even today, they're still competitive, especially a lot of these ex-athletes. They want to be the best that they can be on air. Now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think because everybody knows everybody on social media, I think we all tend to root for each other because we know how difficult it can be. Yeah. But you're still competitiveness there. You want to win. Absolutely. You want to do the best. That's why Stephen A. went on and said, listen, I'm never going to apologize for them paying me $10 million a year mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that's my value. And, yeah. you know. I still think it's crazy to think that somebody would pay $10 million for anybody <laughs> to be on TV and talk and scream, but good on Stephen A. Like good for him that he can get that amount of money and he yeah. wants to be the best. He actually thinks he's underpaid. And I was like, <laughs> I love yeah. that mentality. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That's confidence. That's confidence that he has. So two part question for you. One is which show was your favorite show that you, that you loved. And okay. then just, just walk us through the, the day of producing, what does that look like? The, okay. the day of a producer. So when you ask me about my favorite show, is it the show that I watched or the show that I worked on? Shows that you worked on. I worked on. Okay. So my favorite show that I worked on was probably Mike and Mike, especially my last year. I tell people my last year of working at ESPN, even though I thought I was going to be leaving, was without a doubt my favorite year because I was working on a show that was running like a well-oiled machine. It's like working with Jordan and Pippen in 1998, right? Like they knew by that time what they were doing. They were at the top of their game and you just kind of came in and you were like, ah, I see why this thing is doing so well. Mm -hmm. That's what it felt like when I went and worked on Mike and Mike in 2016. And that show was so much fun. I did more traveling than I ever did at ESPN that last year, going to the NBA finals and seeing Steph battle against LeBron, going to the uh, final four that year in Houston, the year Villanova won the national championship, going cool. to uh, the World Series, the year the Cubs won the World Series. I mean, all of these big events, uh, the Super that's Bowl, right, the they national were doing championship. The traveling and taking people with them. Yeah, that's right. Well, and I got to go. And so that, without a doubt, that year in that show was the most fun I, I ever had. Now, you also asked what a, what a day was like as a producer. Um, there were, it was, there were, there was a, a similarity to all of the days, but there was also the idea that you didn't know what was going to happen that day and you had to adjust. So I'll use Mike and Mike. So I'll give you my last year. This is what it was like working on Mike and Mike. So I would wake up at 3.30 in the morning, guys, because mm. uh, the show started at 6 a.m. I had to be there by 4.30. So I'd wake up about 3.30, get a shower in, wake up, and then drive over to ESPN get to the offices about 4.15, 4.30. I then prepare. The show came on at 6, so I had about an hour and a half to prepare what I needed to prepare for cool. the show. The biggest thing was what happened the night before in sports. So we didn't watch a lot of sports when I worked on Mike and Mike at night because we were sleeping because we had to get up early. 
So we would wake up early the next day and we watch all the highlights. So we watched the highlights, what happened. You know, that was the year that um, Durant was still his last year in Oklahoma City and the finals were a big deal in the playoffs. And so Steph and the Warriors were trying to defend their title. LeBron um, came back from 3-1 and beat Steph. So there was a lot that you couldn't stay up and watch that you had to keep track of. So the next morning was the time to do that. So you'd watch highlights, you catch up on who won and who lost, you get your, um, you know, your content ready for the show. And then Mike and Mike would come in around 5.30 and we would talk with them about the direction of the show. We'd have a quick post-show or a pre-show meeting. And then six o'clock on the air, it was good morning, everyone. Welcome to Mike and Mike. And then we were on the air. And I was one of five people in the studio um, for every show that year. Uh, all wow. the behind the scenes people, a lot of them were in, were in um, you know, the, the behind the scenes areas. But I was actually in a spot because I was the social media director on the show. I was in a designated spot on the show. And so there was many, many, many days where they would call me on the air and say, like, Romano, what's Twitter saying about this? Romano, what do you got for me? I remember that. I had a microphone next to me. Now, I would say a lot. I didn't talk a lot. I mean, I probably spoke 15 times the whole year. But my name was getting brought up a lot. And I didn't Mm -hmm. realize... How many people listen to that show until right. one time a show, Mike Greenberg might say, Romano, what do you see over there? And I would have like 10 people, all these high school friends. Hey, I heard your name. I'm Mike and Mike. And I'm like, <laughs> oh my gosh, all these people hear that <laughs> yes, show. Yes, yes. So we would do the show for four hours, live radio for four hours and television every single morning. That's a lot. Four hours. Most shows are about two hours, two hours maybe right. an hour. This was a four hour show at 10 a.m. You were tired. And then, you know, we would have our post show meeting and get ready for the next day. Like Mm. sports hadn't even happened yet. And we had to start thinking about the next day. Who were the guests we were going to have on? Mm. What were we going to talk about? And then I go back to my desk, work for a couple more hours, preparing for the next day. And then I go home and I get home around one o'clock in the afternoon. And guys, I'm telling you, if you can get a nap in when you work on a morning show, it's the single greatest thing ever. And I would try to get a half hour nap in every day so that I could stay up and be with my wife and my kid at night and then go to bed at a reasonable time, you know, like eight thirty, nine o'clock and then get ready the next day. And it was great. Like I loved it, but it's exhausting when you work on a morning show. I mean, you are dead tired and, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon. You know, you're just done because you woke up at three in the morning and your your mind has to, you know, re-trigger itself to be awake from the evening. Uh, oh, it was yeah. Hard. Oh, yeah. I'm so, so tired. Let me go down here in this five, five-star uh, cafeteria and get me something to eat. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You know, let me yeah, go yeah. through here. It's a big cafeteria. <laughs> it is. Like, get, some, get, some, get some of that chicken curry. Yeah. Well, let me, let me tell you something. We had to buy our own food, though, guys. It wasn't what? free. So, oh, my God. No, we had to pay what? for our own food. It was not free. Wow. That cafeteria oh, was man. every. That's how they make their money. Come on. ESPN employees had to pay, including on-air people, had to pay for their own oh, lunch. Own and dinner. That is wow. crazy. Absolutely. Even the on-air people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You would <sighs> see them in the cafeteria before the show, and they would be like, you know, can I get a grilled chicken sandwich and some fries? And they'd make it and they give it to you. And then you go right to Tammy, who was our cashier every night. And Tammy at the at the cafeteria would, would ring you up and you'd have to pay. Absolutely. Well, I guess you got to be grateful that they did have it in-house that you could get it. So that was I mean, nice. Right. Yeah. The convenience was nice, but yes. it also cost you a little bit. So a lot of people brought their own lunch, too. <laughs> yeah, we want to do a halftime show with you. Okay. This is something that I often do with, with all of our guests, man. These are some quick hitters. So right. we, we're going to come at you with these. And Let's go. All, you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Bring Favorite it. Favorite athlete, Troy Favorite Aikman athlete. or Roger Starbuck? Oh, this is that kind of question. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Roger Starbuck. All right. All right. Roger Starbuck. Okay. He was my first, first, first sports hero when I was like six years old. So I got to go with the old, with the old, uh, you know, the they called guy. him, the, they called him Captain America back then. Um, and he was a scrambling guy. So Roger, the Dodger was what his nickname was. So Roger Staubach for sure. That's okay. Right. That's your, uh, your favorite TV shows and not, not in, in particular, but just give us two. Okay. Um, remember I'm a kid in the eighties, right? So favorite yeah. TV shows, Cosby show, 
for okay. sure. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. Thursday nights on NBC at eight o'clock every week. I would watch it. And uh, I mean, I watched every show. So there's like a thousand I could name. I like different strokes. You guys remember different strokes Absolutely. with Arnold? Love different strokes. Talking about Willis. Absolutely. <laughs> Eight o'clock Mr. and MPC, Drummond, baby. different strokes yes. came on with Mr. Drummond doing his thing. That that those 80s shows were were my favorite as a kid for sure. Favorite sports center episode you produced. Oh, favorite sports center episode I produced. Um it's hard to say favorite because it was such a difficult day. So I'm not going to, I'm going to be careful how I use that word favorite, mm-hmm. but I, I remember the day, uh, 9-11, like the next day, uh, mm-hmm. working on, I was working on game night, not on sports center, but I was working at ESPN and the, the day after 9-11, when you come into work that day and you have to put on a radio show and sports, I mean, the whole world stopped, right? Sports stopped. Uh, that's the most memorable. And that's probably a better word for me to say than favorite. Um, I will say my favorite day at ESPN, though, I'll give you this one, was the day I got to spend an entire day with Daryl Strawberry for eight hours and take him from show to show. And that's my sports hero. You guys are my age, so you know. Daryl Strawberry in the 80s was a big deal. Daryl Strawberry in Jason Romano's life was a huge deal as a kid. And then to get to meet my childhood hero and spend a day with him at ESPN you know, in 2009, I think it was, that was amazing. So wow. okay. that's, that's a good memory. Did you ever work on any other classic ESPN commercials? Good question. So for 17 years, 16 and a half years, I was never on a commercial or, or any behind the scenes commercials. I always wanted to be. In fact, really? I remember the day LeBron, well, because all of the people that are in the background on those, this is Sports Center commercials, are yeah. ESPN employees. They're just employee employees who are working on a show and they're, you know, they, you know, the camera guys come in and they're like, I just want you to stand there. And, you know, once in a while you might have a line or two, but they're all employees of ESPN. So all of these people I worked with, I'm like, dang, man, you got to do that commercial with Tony Romo and you got to be in that commercial with LeBron James. You got to be in that commercial with LaDainian Tomlinson. I said, I want to get in one of those commercials someday. So someday finally came in 2015, um, a buddy of mine uh, found out that they were shooting a commercial in the cafeteria with Matt Harvey. Remember Matt Harvey, the baseball pitcher with the Mets? Yeah. And at that time, Matt Harvey was top of the top of the heap for the Mets. And I'm a huge Mets fan. So my buddy Ben says, uh, come on over. And I think I can get you to meet Matt Harvey. And I'm like, I don't want to meet Matt Harvey. I want to be in the commercial with Matt Harvey. <laughs> <laughs> and he says... We can get you in the commercial, but you're going to be way in the background. I said, I don't care if I'm even if all you can see is like the back of my head. That counts. Well, that's exactly what happened, guys. So Matt Harvey in this commercial with the Sports Center anchors has like he's eating ice cream out of a giant helmet. And it's a parody. Remember, we used to have those little baseball helmets as kids and we would eat the ice cream out of it. Mm -hmm. So the commercial is Matt Harvey eating out of this giant ice cream helmet. You can find it on the Internet. And if you watch in the background, our ESPN employees having lunch, like it's no big deal because it's at the cafeteria. Well, back there with his head turned ever so slightly was (laughs) yours truly. And I was was like, I got the commercial, baby. (laughs) That's right. That's right. I was so happy. I got the side of my head and that's me. I'm telling you. That's it. That's right. (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. (laughs) That was it. Takeout or home cooked meal? Oh, uh, home cooked, especially if it's my wife, like when she sits down and makes a really good, uh, you know, chicken and rice type of thing with some fresh mm-hmm. bread. Yeah. It's hard to beat that. Hard it's hard to beat that. that. Favorite that. arena, favorite arena to watch a game. Oh, that's a good question. It's, it's the easy answer for me is the TD garden because the Celtics play there. Um, and I'm a Celtics fan, but I got to watch a game once in um where was that game it was in cleveland it was at the nba finals in cleveland when the Cavs and the warriors played in game i guess it was game three in 2016 that was the finals when lebron came back from 3-1 okay. and they shouldn't beat the warriors but they did um and he just did crazy lebron things that year <laughs> that arena at that moment watching lebron against steph 
I mean, it's hard to beat that. And that, those Cavalier, those Cleveland fans are crazy because they yeah. haven't won anything for right. so many years. Yeah. And so when you're at a, a place like that and you have fans that are just going crazy and they're so hungry, that was a pretty cool experience to watch a basketball game. Now, you said arena. I will say the best sports experience I ever had watching a game was not in an arena. It was at a stadium. And it was in uh, it was in Columbus, Ohio, when I saw Ohio State play against Nebraska okay. at the shoe, at the horseshoe, and eighty five thousand, whatever it is, a hundred thousand fans, uh, all Damn. in unison cheering the fight song, all knowing what to do at certain moments of the game because they are obviously you know going to these games all the time. There was nothing like that atmosphere that I've ever seen ever. Wow. The most wow. insane arena I've ever been to was the Cowboy Stadium, Jerry World. When you walk into that, you're you're in a death Jerry zone. World. You know, you're in like a giant yeah. you know, Star Wars, you know, kind of, you know, action, you know, uh, ride or something. But yes, he uh, definitely built a shrine to himself. Oh my gosh, it is huge. <laughs> it's ridiculously huge. Yes, but yes. Columbus, Ohio, Ohio State, that's huge. It's 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 oh. such a, it was neat. That was a neat experience. This may be the toughest one. Okay. Favorite ESPN Sports Center commercial. I got this. I know this because I just tweeted about this a couple months ago. It popped on my timeline. You guys remember George Mirasan, the seven foot seven yeah, guy from the Washington it. Bullets? Yeah. Yeah, There's a sure. commercial. There's a commercial with George Mirasan dancing with Kenny Main and with Carl Ravitch. It was on your page. Yes, it it was. Just, uh, and it just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it was like, oh, there's George Mirasan walking through ESPN, and he stops and some music plays, and he starts dancing with two <laughs> yes. of the anchors. It was the most ridiculous thing. But I tell you guys, every time I see it, I laugh. You and laugh. I laugh loudly. Now, I got one more for you. Do you remember John Clayton used to be an ESPN NFL reporter? Mm -hmm. And there's a commercial where John Clayton was reporting the news on SportsCenter, right? And then they cut behind the scenes on what John Clayton looks like. So after he does his news hit, remember, this is the commercial, mm -hmm. he takes off his fake <laughs> dress shirt. Yes, he, has a, yes. he has a Metallica cut-off shirt. He lets his hair down. <laughs> And he starts rocking to Metallica. And I'm and like, this is... And don't forget, he's in his mom's basement. And he's in his... Hey, mom! <laughs> get out of here. my segment. Yeah. Yes, it's, yes. A, it's when that commercial came out, and I remember seeing a preview of that in the office, I almost died. I said, I cannot <laughs> believe John Clayton agreed to do that commercial. But it's one of the best. I put that at number two right behind George Muir's <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and I did see that George Murison on your on your page. I thought that was yes. hilarious. Because yes. nobody could dance. <laughs> and the funny thing is, I never knew this. George Murison's on Twitter and he retweeted my tweet. I'm like, who knew where George Murison's been the last 15 what? years? <laughs> right, right. Look him up. He's got a, a, a unique spelling to his name and he's on there. And well, you, you say go a on man his page, is in his basement. Right. right. <laughs> He is in his mom's seven, basement. Seven. Well, yeah. not George Murison. That was John Clayton. But yeah, right. John Clayton. still, yeah, he was in his mom's basement. Oh, my gosh. That is crazy. Such good memory. Such good memory. I got to look at that one. I got to look at that one. With, thank you for our halftime segment. We want to jump into what this piece we call really for you, and I think a lot of us, going from sports to significance. Mm, uh, the like transition it. in your life. Um Mm -hmm. You know, talk to us a little bit about when you kind of knew things, life was beginning to change and decisions needed to be made uh, as you were getting ready to move away from ESPN. Yeah. So that started for me in 2008. So almost eight, nine years before I left. I'll never forget the day I was training to be a television producer. So I was a TV producer. I was a TV booker at that time, if you, get, if you not make sense. So I was booking guests on the shows and I was trying to become a TV producer. And I went into work one day. It was right after the Celtics had won the championship the year that KG and those guys beat the Lakers. And I went into the office and I was working and training on an overnight show at that time. So I went in at like five o'clock in the afternoon. I stayed till like three in the morning. It was like the opposite of Mike and Mike, right? And so I went over to this late show and I was training. And I remember the person who was training me said, if you get this job, this is going to be what you're going to do. 
And I thought, I went home that night and I laid in bed and I thought, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. And what I mean by that is I didn't mean I didn't want to work at ESPN. I just knew if I took that job, that five o'clock at night job, I would never see my kid. My daughter was four at the time. Um, mm. And we only we only have one child. So it's not like I could make it up with the second or third child. Right, I only right. have one. So I said, I cannot take this job and maybe get a couple of you know, I think it was like $15,000 potentially in a raise. I, I, it wasn't worth it to me to mm. miss out on my kid's life. Like I, mm. I, I didn't know how long, cause I knew once I said yes, if they, if they promoted me that, that they, they in essence owned me, right. They could put me wherever they wanted and I wasn't going to say no, or I would just have to leave ESPN. So I said, let me stay in a job that maybe pays a little less, but I have a little bit more freedom on and I can see my kid and spend time with my family. Now that's hard because at ESPN, when do sports happen? At night and on the weekends. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard. It's very hard to just say, you know what? I'm gonna be home. You know, but I knew what my job was a unique job where I could be home more often than I wasn't. And I just I always harp back to my dad, right? My dad tried so hard but he wasn't present in our lives. Like he was in and out of our lives. And so I, I just knew I did not want to be the in and out of life dad with my daughter. And so I told ESPN at that time, I said, I, I, I'm not going to pursue this producer position. And, uh, they respected it. Um, mm -hmm. I had some people tell me that that wasn't a wise decision, but I said, I, I, it's, it's, it's as wise as it can be for me because I needed to make sure that I was around my kid. Right. So it is wise. Well, it's wise now, but at the time it wasn't wise because everybody was so focused on the promotion and the money. Oh, Arthur. yeah, all of that. So yeah, but they said that's not wise. It's like me saying, uh, I don't know if this is an equivalent of it, but it's like me making good money playing overseas, and it's a perfect situation for my family. And then the NBA calls and says, "Well, we're going to offer you a little bit more money, but you're never going to see your family. What would you right. do?" That's kind of what it was. And I had to make the choice. I knew it was going to be uh, a career, career wise, a potential setback, yeah. but family wise, it was going to be everything. I was going to get to see my family. So, but that started the trajectory of me potentially leaving ESPN because I always knew that I wanted to be around my family, but I also wanted to do work that I felt like had a greater purpose in my life. My faith mm. really, really became important to me. Uh, in my thirties and where I started to really understand that there's something bigger than just Jason or even ESPN. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I wanted to raise my kid and, and show her that way as well. And, um, as I started getting more serious about my faith and going to church and, mm -hmm. um, you know, things like that, I recognized that maybe God wanted to bring me away from ESPN someday. And I didn't know when that was going to be, or if that was even going to happen, but I just started thinking maybe there's something bigger and greater for me to do. And uh, it's hard to think that way because ESPN is is the, the pinnacle Mecca. of sports broadcasting, yeah. right? It's what I dreamed yeah. about doing. But my dream changed around 2016 when I realized, okay, I don't know where I'm going, but I think it's away from ESPN. And right. uh, But I didn't just recklessly leave ESPN. Like that wasn't wise. Um, I sought a lot of wise counsel. I talked to a lot of people. Um, I prayed obviously about it too, but I talked to a lot of people and just spent 2016 when Mike and Mike was over asking for wisdom. You know, am I crazy to think I might leave ESPN? What does your job entail? How did you get to where you got to? And in doing that, that allowed me to meet a lot of different people. And one of those people was the person that offered me uh, an opportunity to go work for a place called Sports Spectrum, which is where I work now. And Sports Spectrum tells stories. Uh, just like ESPN does on a smaller scale, but okay. we intersect the conversation with faith. A lot of athletes, including Mr. Gates down there, who was on our show, a lot of athletes or, or former athletes, faith is the most important thing in their life. And Ooh. faith is a part of pretty much every person that you meet on some level. And so let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. That's kind of what my conversation was, was let's talk about mm. that. Let's bring, let's bring faith back into the conversation. It doesn't have to dominate it, but let's bring it back in. And that's what Sports Spectrum does. It's, it's called the, it's where sports and faith connect. And so we try to bring those athletes on 
those cool. those coaches on, those broadcasters on, a lot of ESPN people I've had on, obviously. And we try to have a conversation about sports, about their journey, just like we've been doing here. But then I get intentional and ask, tell me about your faith, which is a question that you don't hear a lot for obvious reasons at ESPN, because they're all about sports. But the most important thing in a lot of these people's lives is their faith, and they never get to talk about it. So I thought, what a cool opportunity to merge two of my passions, my faith and my sport and my and obviously sports, bring those two together and let's find and carve out a little niche that's different than what other people are doing and see if it, you know, hits hits somewhere and it's it's been pretty neat to be a part of. There's a lot of people out there whose faith are important to them and who love sports. And you've been doing this for how long now? For 4 years. 4 years. Really? Yeah. And how is the how is the time spending with your family? Are you able to you able to do this show and be with them, right? I work from home. I spend more time now with my family. My daughter's graduating high school next year. Oh, and wow. remember at that time she was four years old when I yeah. first had that thought. So now she's 17. She just turned 17 last week. Mm. I've been the present dad. And you know, I, I don't take all the credit for that. Obviously, I, I give credit to my wife and and certainly to God, but my, my desire and my hope and my dream, if you will, in 2008 was to spend more time with my kid. Thankfully that's happened. And I've been there for her. And I wanted her to, I wanted her to know that no matter what goes on, mm -hmm. dad's there. I'm going to be there if you need mm, me. Yep. And that's a big deal for me. You know, it's, obviously it's yeah. a big deal for every parent, yep. but for me, not having that from my own dad, uh, I yeah. needed to make sure that my kid knew, knew. that I was going to be there. And even leaving this job, you know, this job, leaving this job was, was very hard. It was a 40% pay cut. There were no oh. benefits. I was betting on myself, guys. I really was. And I was trusting God to do that. That's right. And he provided. I'll just be honest with you. And, and it took about a year for me to see that the, the plan and the door that was opening when I left ESPN but I had no idea when I really left what was going to happen. But he opened mm. the door, and I've, I've written two books, got this podcast with millions of downloads, opportunities to speak and share. So, I get to be on the Hoop Dreams podcast with YouTube. Right, right. Like, those are things that I never thought or dreamed about when I was leaving ESPN. But the doors have, that have opened have been beyond my imagination. So I don't regret leaving. But your book is actually my my summer read, by the way. That's my summer read. The one oh, that you were, the one of you and your father. That's my summer read. Okay. Live so I was, gonna, I was gonna piggyback on it what you said. So it's safe to say okay. that you walked out on faith. That's it. I, I like to tell people that um I took a leap of faith. You like that? And took a leap of faith. Bet on yourself. You knew yes. God had something better for you. You just didn't know what. And that was hard because a lot of people, when they saw that, were like, are you sure? Because ESPN is kind of the best place, right? Like when you, <laughs> when you want to work in broadcasting, where do you aspire to work? ESPN, if you're a sports broadcaster. Mm -hmm. So are you sure that there's something better it, it involves leaving ESPN? And I said, mm -hmm. well, I don't know 100%. I just feel like this is where I'm supposed to go. But I tell people, guys, you don't really know whether that was the door you were supposed to walk through until you look back. Mm -hmm. And when you look back, you can say, okay, clearly that wasn't the door I was supposed to walk through or it was because, yep. you know, your, your circumstances start to, to be laid out in front of you and you realize, okay, maybe I made a mistake here or there. Uh, I did not make a mistake. God did really? not make a mistake because when I left, uh, all of these opportunities opened up and I said, oh, that's why uh, I was supposed to leave. Ah, uh, uh, okay. Didn't know that when I was doing it. I was a little uh, scared, but then I saw what happened and I realized, okay, that's what the Lord was trying to do in my life. And I didn't know. I just trusted. Yeah. And like you said, took a leap of faith, Arthur. And that's, yeah. that's where we are. But now four years later, I could see clearly the plan that was laid out in front of me that I was supposed to walk in. So what is the Jason Romano faith story? The faith story. Okay. I, I didn't know if we were going to go there, Will, but let's go well, there. You, you know, uh, I was going to take you there. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. We, yeah, we going there. Okay, Pastor Will, here we go. <laughs> um, now, I, it's funny. When I grew up, I was a kid that grew up um, going to the Catholic church with my grandfather. 
Um, and I made all of my first communion and confirmation and things that, you know, the good Catholic boys do when they're kids. Um, but I didn't, I went to church, but I did it out of obligation. I didn't care uh, about church. Uh, I couldn't tell you anything that I learned in those, in those classes. Mm -hmm. um, I told you guys, sports was my God, and that's all I cared about. Um, I just did this because my mom and my grandfather kind of made me. And, you know, my grandfather said, if you go to church with me, uh, I'll buy you a, a hamburger and fries after and we'll go bowling or we'll go watch some sports and play some video games or something. I was like, let's go. I'll go wherever you want me to go if I'm going to get that. So that was kind of my church life as a kid. Uh, as I got older into high school and into college, you know, it was non-existent. I, I, again, I was super focused, hyper focused on graduating and getting a job in broadcasting. That was it. Um, and then, you know, potentially getting married and having kids and just kind of living my life, right? The American dream. But something happened in my mid twenties. Uh, my brother Chris, the one who I told you guys about, that became a pastor, right? Mm -hmm. So he was the first in our family to really begin what I like to say is a relationship with the Lord. Like he, and it was weird when I saw him become, uh, you know, so involved in his faith. I thought this guy's crazy. Like there's something weird and wrong with him. Um, but that's because he was really living a tough life and, and a pretty bad life down, you know, going down the wrong path for many, many months mm -hmm. and then just did a 180. And when you do a 180 and you see a different person, you're like, okay, that's good, but it's also very strange what happened there. And yeah. so I spent the next two years watching my brother completely transform his life and God completely transforming my brother's life. And I, I became very attracted to the life that he was living. And I mean, what I mean by that is he was loving his wife really well in a, in a way that I'd not seen before. Remember, we grew up in a home that was divorced. So we didn't see that husband and wife um, example, right? So I saw my brother love his wife in an amazing way. My, my nephew was born, uh, my brother's uh, first son. He had five kids and his first son uh, was born 21 years ago. And I, I was not you know, serious about my faith, but I watched my brother become a dad and raise his kid and love his kid in a, an amazing way. Mm. And I was like, I want to, I want that. I want to be like that someday. And this is my younger brother, by the way. But to me, he was my like older, younger brother. because he was doing things that I wanted to do. And so one day I said to him, I said, Chris, I, I'm so impressed with who you've become. What, what's going on here, man? And he started sharing with me about his faith. And he said, Jay, I'm telling you, once I got straight with God, like this is, this is what came from that. And it wasn't mm. like super religious, weird, weird person. It was just a guy who right. loved unconditionally in a way that I was so impressed by. Mm. So I was really just in watching that one day in 2001, I went to his church with him. Guys, you'll like this. So I, I told you, we grew up in a Catholic church. My brother became a Christian in a Pentecostal church. And I'm talking about full gospel. Yeah, full I'm gospel. Talking about praying in tongues. I'm talking about you know, worship music. So yes, yes. if you guys know the experience of either church, the Catholic church is on this end, yes. much more calm and somber and quiet. It's like a library. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah. The Pentecostal church is a lot like, in many ways, the Black Baptist Church, the too. Black Baptist like it's kind of right. screaming, <laughs> dancing. Oh, yes. Thank you, Lord. Hands being braced. It's completely the other end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I went to my brother's church that day, and it was like that. And I remember thinking, my goodness, this is weird. But the message that day, and I don't remember what it was, resonated with me. You know, the pastor stood up there, and he shared a message. And I was just like, wow, that's I like that. I don't know if I like the whole worship music and clapping and hands right. raised thing. That doesn't right. feel like church to me. But that message resonated with me. So I told my brother and he said, uh, he's like, the message resonated with you, huh? He's like, come here. So we went into the back bedroom of his house that day and he sat me down and he shared with me the hope that he had. He shared with wow. me the gospel uh, that's found in the Bible. And I tell people I had no idea what I was saying yes to that day. I didn't understand it. It didn't right. make uh, full sense to me, but my heart was open to at least say yes and begin a journey. Mm. And I prayed with my brother that day, and that was the day that my my faith really took shape for me. And I started this mm. journey with the Lord. And 
now it's 20 years later and I can tell you it's, it's grown and it's evolved. Mm -hmm. Um, it's had ebbs and flows and ups and downs, Mm -hmm. but it's the best decision that I ever made in my life because now, and again, you, you lose this a little bit, but you remember that it's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about anything here. It's about a greater purpose. It's about something bigger. And honestly, it started with me just knowing where I was going to go when I was going to die. <laughs> like that's, mm. you know, that's what we hear about, but that's really yes, what it yes, was. Yes. Like, do you know where you're going when you die? And yeah. if your answer is no, I don't, or I'm not sure, then you do actually yeah. know where you're going. You're just yeah. not, you know, you don't, you haven't, you haven't placed your faith and trust in the Lord yet. And so for me, I, I started there, but it became so much more guys. It became more of a relationship. It became more of a journey and then a responsibility when I have my daughter to raise her that way and, you know, give her an opportunity to make that decision for herself as well. Mm -hmm. And thankfully she has, but it's, it's been really a lot of fun. And I never, ever thought number one, that I would be calling myself a Christian or be a man of faith. Never had any interest of that as a kid. Never had any examples of that as a kid. But I certainly never thought that I would be standing here at 47 years old hosting a rate or hosting a sports show mm-hmm. and talking to people about Jesus. Like that, that would have been the most laughable, comical thing I would have ever thought would happen to me when I was 25. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. when we make plans, God laughs. That's what I tell people. Because it ain't about <laughs> our plans, it's about his. And it's brought me to where I am now, and I'm just so grateful. And I love that the work I get to do is mm-hmm. to bring glory to his name, not to mine. And right. that's, that's my goal. That's, that's what I am now. I'm all about sports. I love sports. We could talk all day about sports, but that's not the most important thing in my life. That's not the center of who I am. Um, that's not my identity. Uh, it's in something much bigger than that. So that's my, that's my faith story. I love it. I love yeah. it. And, and, and obviously it resonates with others too, because sports spectrum has grown tremendously. I mean, yeah. uh, like I listened to your podcast, man, the, 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 the interviews you conduct. Yeah. Powerful. Does, does that like amaze you that here are these athletes really that, you know, it, it used to be a time that you really couldn't even for all purpose intended, they couldn't even say the word Jesus on air or people profess their faith. And now, yeah. you know, there's this element that folks are like, I mean, before they even get their interview, they stop you. Well, first, I want to thank my Lord and Savior. I mean, does that amaze <laughs> you where it's at now? Yeah, it does. I mean, listen, I get that it's not everybody's cup of tea. I'm not ever here to force faith on anyone ever. In fact, if you want to believe something different, all the power to you. Let's talk about it. Let's not be all weird about it or taboo Mm -hmm. about it, but let's talk about it. But um, I do think that in a day and age where in some cases, cancel culture will push you aside if you believe in something that's not where everybody's going. But I think there's another avenue too that is more open if you come at it from a perspective like I just said, like I'm not forcing it on you. I'm just Mm -hmm. sharing these stories and these people love their faith. So if you want to listen, great. You know, you don't ever have to do anything. You don't have to listen to any show that I do. You don't have to listen to this show. You can turn it right off if you want, if it's not your cup of tea. But that doesn't mean that others would not be interested in this. I think there are a lot of people. And uh, I found in the athletes that I've talked to, whenever I asked them to come on, there's only been a couple um, that have said no. But for the most part, everybody they light up. They're like, wait a minute, you want to ask me about my faith? Yes. Let's talk about it because it's the most important thing in my life. And I never get a chance to have a conversation about it. So I I find that people appreciate the platform that we have because it's not available really anywhere else. Now you might, like you said, you might talk to an athlete and they might say, I'd like to thank my Lord and savior. And then the questions are about football, 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 or basketball, basketball, basketball. But I might not even need you to say, I want to think like, I know that you're a Christian. So let's, let's talk about why that's important in your life. Let's talk mm-hmm. about your faith mm-hmm. story. Let's talk about right. the, the wrestling that you have in your life with God, which is a real mm-hmm. thing that a lot of people have. So let's talk about that. Let's be real about it. Let's be authentic about it. 
Um, so I think it's a, it's in a it's in a really exciting time, especially with technology yeah. and the way that we've evolved. The fact that we can do this the way we're doing this right now, I think it's really amazing where we are at today. And why not have a place and a platform to kind of talk about sports and talk about faith? I think it's I think it's fair, especially in basketball and football. It's a pretty natural, you know marriage, if you will, mm-hmm. when you talk to an athlete and they're talking about their faith, because there are a lot of athletes that have a faith. You don't know how deep or how shallow it is, right? but there it's, it's, but it's there. And so let's, let's have a conversation about it. That's a great idea to have a show surrounded, you know, uh, by that for, for athletes to share their stories, you know, such as that. I mean, your, your show is a, is a storytelling show about that's someone's right. giving some information about about them that the outside public probably didn't know about. You know what I'm That's saying? Right. Like, because they worried about them being a basketball player. But, oh, I didn't know that this guy, you know, felt that way about his faith and about God and about yep. testimonials and what, what happened, you know, the belief factor in that. So, I mean, you think about it, you got two million downloads. So you're doing something <laughs> great on that on that show. And what? Yeah. I mean, four years ago, I mean, two million downloads. I mean, how does that happen? That means a lot of people are, there's a lot of people that, you know what I'm saying, that that love, that want to talk about that and be on the show. I'm sure you know this. Like, when you're in the midst of film and hoop dreams, you don't realize how many people are going to watch that someday and and know who you are. Maybe you do on some level, but you don't know it's going to be what it turned out to be, right? Oh, no. This iconic show. You don't know that. Yeah. And like I said, you don't know that today people are still going to discover it on HBO and be like, let me look up this Arthur Agee guy and this Will Gates guy. Let me see where they are. And oh, here they are. They got a podcast. Let's listen to it. You don't know that yep. when you're when you're in the midst of it. And I didn't know that when I was starting Sports Spectrum's podcast that we were going to eventually get 2 million downloads. I didn't know that. Um, I, I thought there might be an audience for it. And kind of, we were discussing this before we even hit record, but you just don't know. You got you to gotta have a lot of help and, you know, a lot of faith, but a lot of help. And, you know, you got to rely on your guests, mm-hmm. um, to be quite honest, to share about the podcast. You got to tap into all your resources and all the people that you know and ask them to share mm-hmm. about it and then hope that it sticks, hope that there is a place for it. And for us, I think we found that we have a niche. Um, yep. I, I wished we were bigger, to be quite honest. You know, it's like what Stephen A said. You know, I think we should be, you know, getting a million downloads every year. But you know, that's, that's not in my control. And so I, I understand that. I think our product is a good quality product and hopefully people will mm. check it out. You know, hopefully they listen to this and subscribe to this. And then if they want, they can check mine out too. Well, you're in this new age of media, yeah, sports now, you're doing things differently. 17 years again um, at ESPN, but now you also are transitioning at Sports Spectrum. You're doing more than just podcasting you're the you know the the media director i mean you win <laughs> you're doing a bunch of things over there what's what else is going on with jason well we have the media director position is a different position because now i can't just host shows i need to oversee and you know i i, I get to play boss i guess on some level and i like that it's probably a good place to be at mm-hmm. my stage of life you know 47 and kind of overseeing and directing and giving wisdom to younger people but I, I still, um, I still get it. It's, it's kind of like going from playing to coaching. I still want to play some too. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I like hosting, but there's the, the responsibilities are there. You know, I have to oversee all of our content on the website, uh, on our magazine. We have a magazine, uh, quarterly magazine that goes out that people can subscribe to. Um, we're doing uh, special side projects. We got, uh, you know, all sorts of things that we have plan and hopefully you know we we start to go into uh documentaries someday you know all of these things that i desire to do Mm -hmm. um that that's it's it's cool to dream but there's a lot more responsibility with that too so that's happening and then on the other side uh because of espn and sports spectrum it's presented me opportunities like i said to write a couple books and to Mm. Um, you know, just to speak and to do things that I really never desired to do speaking, wow. never desired to do it, uh, write books, never wanted to <laughs> do not enjoy writing, but here we are. So here yeah. we are. that's what's up. But give us that, give us that, you know, give us the name of your books. 
So we got two books. The first one um, you mentioned about my dad, and we were talking about my dad earlier. Uh, my dad and I reconciled, um, and I learned a lot about forgiveness in the process of reconciling with my dad. And so I wrote a book about it. My dad signed off, gave me all the permission to do it. So it's not like I'm, you know, going behind his back here. Um, and I wrote a book called Live to Forgive, which is my story. But also, um, I think a lot of nuggets from the Bible and from other people's experiences on why forgiveness is so important for us in our lives. And I think all of us have been hurt on some level. And when we're younger, I think it's a little easier to hang on to that bitterness and anger. But the older I've gotten, I'm sure you guys have felt this way too, the more we realize if we carry that anger with us, um, the less effective we're going to be as people. Um, for ourselves and for our family. And, you know, forgiveness is, I think it's the one of the single biggest obstacles that people struggle with that prevent them from having true freedom in their life. And I live this because I had bitterness for years and years until my early forties with my dad. And so we wrote this book about it. It's called Live to Forgive. And uh, I think it's going to help a lot of people because it's not just my story, but it's also application yeah. ways that people can in, you know, begin a process of their own to forgive someone. And then the yeah. second book I wrote is a lot more, uh, it's a lighter book. Let's put it that way. It's, it's fun. It's leadership lessons learned from my time working at ESPN. So we talked about all these ESPN stories. That second book, it's called the uniform of leadership. It's a leadership book disguised as stories of my 17 years at ESPN. And that was a lot of fun. That book was a lot more mm. fun to write than the first book. But uh, I like both books. They're just different. One is on forgiveness and a little heavier and deep. Mm -hmm. And the other one is is on leadership and how we can be better leaders and better men. But it's a lot more fun and practical and has fun stories in it. So and where can they find these books? They're on Amazon. So okay. just Amazon.com. You can also get them at my website, uh, which is just my name, JasonRomano.com. Okay. Um, or if you want to hit me up on Twitter, um, for some reason you want me to sign one, which I kind of laugh at, like, why would you want me to sign a book? But I get it. Um, I'll be happy. I'll be happy to sign a copy and you can order it directly from me that way too. So either way, whatever awesome. people want. Awesome. Yeah. Jason, man, we've, we've taken so much of your time and I want, I want to thank you for your time. Um, You're welcome. But there is, um, a few more questions that Arthur and I like to ask you. Arthur's going to hit you with the big question, but this question here, man, I just want to, I just want to touch on it because um, it's it's about the things you're talking about forgiveness, and I just want to just since we're we're, we're in the area of faith, yeah. But I, I just want to get your thoughts on faith and social justice and and athletes using their platforms mm. now. Okay, I think uh, you know we went through a lot in the last year and a half. I mean, it's just as a country, as a society. Uh, when, when I saw what happened to George Floyd and I thought, my goodness, um, how is this still happening? You know, in 2020, the injustices, um, and I really didn't understand it. I mean, I'm a white, a white dude who's in his forties, right? Like what did I, I went through a lot with my dad and things like that, but I never was, was profiled because of what I look like. And I didn't understand that. And I grew up in a predominantly white neighborhood, uh, with a lot of white friends. Um, there was, I think maybe like six or seven, um, black kids in our school, you know? So we, we weren't around enough to, to see that racism existed. Um, I will tell you that I knew that it was there because my grandparents and I love them. They're the best grandparents ever, but they grew up in a time where calling people certain names, um, just because of how they looked or what color they were was sort of socially accepted. Uh, back then. And so they would carry that with them when I was kids and I heard it and I was like, that doesn't sound right. That word's not a good word to say, <laughs> but it didn't dawn on me that it was still going on here, you know, in 2020. And it's certainly, I think it's different. It's masked a little yep. differently, mm -hmm. um, but it's still there. And I think what, what it took was a George Floyd incident for me to begin to seek out my black friends now, and I got a lot more than I certainly did when I was a kid, um, and people I work with at ESPN and other people, mm -hmm. and just said, I just want to understand what's going on here. I'm not trying to say anybody's right or wrong. I certainly didn't want to politicize it. And right. unfortunately, it became a political thing. And I get why I understand that. 
but I didn't want to politicize it because I'm a person of faith and I want to look at everything through the lens of the gospel of Jesus. And I'm like, all right, if, if Jesus is seeing that, that's an injustice. Well, what does he talk about in the Bible about justice? He says to seek justice, to love mercy and walk humbly. Okay. So he also talks about, I'm talking about Jesus here, talks about loving your neighbor as yourself, right? And that is, there's no racism in that. And he's not talking about your neighbor that lives next door. He's talking about every person you come in contact with to love them unconditionally. Yeah. We're not good at that as humans. Um, and so I think, you, you know, I'm going a little deeper than what you asked. I think athletes should use their platform to share whatever they want. That's just my opinion. I never believe in the shut up and dribble moniker that I think somebody yeah. on TV said about LeBron once. I don't agree with that. Yeah. But I also know that just because LeBron James might say, stand and say something doesn't mean I have to agree with him. Yeah. But I can't deny his right to say that. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to go on social media and say, LeBron's just a basketball player. I don't have to listen to him. No, he's a person, a human being. A human being. <laughs> just like you and I are. So he can say whatever he wants. Again, I might not agree with him on some things. I might agree with him on other things. But he has every right to do that. It's just like the Kaepernick, Kaepernick situation. Yep. I'd never understood why certain people were so angry that he was kneeling for the national anthem. I get the whole flag thing, and certain people have this pride, American pride. Yep. But the people who fought for that flag fought so that Kaepernick could kneel for that right, too, and protest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to agree with Kaepernick, but you don't have to, you can't disagree with his right to do that. Right. And we turn this thing into so much displeasure from both sides and screaming and yelling. And it's become, unfortunately, a divided country. And so I'm really saddened by where we are. But I know, you know, the faith that I have preaches unity. And I mean real unity. And unity, right. in my opinion, is all of us coming together and saying, even though we might disagree, we're still humans and we can love each other and get along. Yeah. And uh, we're missing that right now. And I, yeah. I want more athletes to come out, to not speak out just against injustice, but to speak out more for unity, for real unity, especially if you're a Christian athlete, to speak out for unity in the body of Christ. I, I found last year that a lot of Christian athletes were standing up for the injustices that were taking place, like the George Floyd incident. But their lens, if they're, if they're a Christian, should always start with Jesus. And so like, speak up through that lens, not just the lens of a Black Lives Matter type protest, mm -hmm. yeah. which is important to speak up for things like that, but to speak up through the lens of unity, through the lens of, um, in my opinion, through faith, especially if you're a person of faith. But we got a lot of work to do. You know, we do. Yeah. And I think if we all understand that, we can push forward together as opposed to trying to push forward apart. And unfortunately, I think politics is, is toxic. I think it's toxic on both sides. And I think both sides, even though they're both trying to preach about unity, do everything they can to, to unify people to their side, right. which then divides half the country. Mm -hmm. And it's, I don't know what the answer is. That's why I don't even look to politics to try and give me the answer. I look mm -hmm. to my faith and I look to like, to people like you two and let's just, talk and have a conversation and have a real discussion and not try to pay attention to what people on TV are trying to tell us to believe. I like that, man. I, I heard so many things that came out, biblical conviction, and and there's a standard that many folks do not adhere to that they need to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, listen, I get everybody's not going to believe the same thing either, but I think if you're talking from a moral perspective, just trying to be a good person, mm -hmm. you know, you can't, you can't ask for diversity and unity and then rip on the other person for them not believing and agreeing for what you believe in because you just said, I want diversity. You know what diversity <laughs> is? Diverse opinions, diversity. So we have to be okay with people who have a diverse opinion That's right. on what we believe, but we aren't. So many people are preaching, we want equality and diversity. And it's like, well, equality means equality for everyone including the person that you don't agree with. with. And, That's right. <laughs> and there's a lot of hypocrites out there, unfortunately. But um, 
like I said, conversations like this are really where I try to lean towards and just talk to people like you guys and have conversations even off the air when it's not mm-hmm. a broadcast yeah. um, with people and just say, hey, man, hey man what's, what's, what's your feeling on this? What's, what's your deal? And even if I disagree, um, I still love you. I'm still with you. I'm, a, I'm in your corner and uh, hopefully you'll be in mine. You, know? you can agree to disagree, but I can still want the best for you as a human being and for your life. Yeah, I just wish, like, even certain people with very large platforms last year were saying, like, if you vote for Donald Trump or Joe Biden, you're this, you know, and it's like, I can never be friends with you. I could never talk to you. And I'm like, you are stereotyping people to a point where you're classifying them on who they are based upon a vote Mm -hmm. for an election. Are you kidding me? And then you'd be like this. Well, who told you to think like that? That's not the way that's not the way Jesus Christ told you in the Bible. That's right. That's right. And I don't I didn't get it. I did I just didn't get it and that's why I I told you guys to, politics are toxic and are meant they're trying to unite, they're meant to, to unite. Unfortunately, they're they're really there to divide and to gain to gain 51% of the people to like them and have the rest of them they don't care about. And that's on both sides. And that's why I just try not to deal with politics. I try to, I try to look at my faith, who Jesus is, who the people around me are, and how can I serve and love them? That's it. Well, let me throw another one at you because this, yeah. this goes along right with that. Everybody's offended these days. I know. Democrats are offended. Republicans are offended. Independents are offended. Blacks are offended. Whites are offended. Hispanics are offended. Asians are offended, you know, cats are offended, dogs are offended, you know. Right, yeah. You know, you look, everybody, what, what's your take on just the level of offense and where is this leading us um, in terms of change? Like, how, how do we grow and get better if everybody is on the offense now? We got to break the barriers of offense, of being offended, and we got to sit down at the table with people who look different, talk different, believe different, and act different. We have to do that. And that's the only way that we're going to be able to really have change and proceed and move forward is if we break down those barriers and just have conversations. If we just sit in social media with our phones on our couch and watch MSNBC or Fox News all day, we're just going to sit there and be offended about everything, right? And it's real easy if you want to be offended about everything to be offended about everything. We got to get past that. And by the way, social media, even though it's a great platform and I love being on there, you know, to, to, to share positive encouragement, it's really toxic and it's not real in a lot of cases. There are real people behind those keyboards, but so much is said on social media that would never, ever be said in person, ever. And so that's not real. You know, that's not real. So we have to break down the barriers, I think, Will and, and Arthur and just have conversations. You know, there's a great podcast called Table 40. And the idea is to, who would you want to have at your table to have a conversation with? And I love the idea of the table, right? Who would you invite at your table? I probably wouldn't invite all the people that look like me, talk like me, think like me, act like me. I might gravitate towards that because you get along with people who are like-minded. And, you know, that's why 18,000 people can come together in a stadium and be best mm-hmm. friends because they're all rooting for the same team and high-fiving, right? But I think the real change in people's life, the real opportunities for transformation happen when we sit down with people we don't agree with, we don't understand, who look different, who speak different, who act different, who come from different places, right? You have to. You guys grew up in a much different situation, at least as far as I saw in the documentary, than, than I have. And so let's sit down and talk about the differences because Mm -hmm. it's going to be different. Um, Although you might have had dad issues just like I did. I think you did, Arthur, right? From the movie, if I remember. So like we we have that, we have that in common and it doesn't mean that's a good thing, but we have that in common. So even though I came from a predominantly small white, you know, town in upstate New York, Mm -hmm. and you guys might've came from a little bit more of an inner city Chicago area, we still have more in common if we just sit down and start talking about it. And Mm. unfortunately, people, especially out in social media world, will automatically put us in in buckets and try to divide us. Mm. And uh, we have to fight through that. We have to fight through that. 
you got and you got to be and you got to have and you got to be like like God minded to not fall for that to yes. where people where society try to pit people together you got to be so mentally strong and and, and 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 you know and and some people not and we pray that they do we, we you know we really pray it goes back to that word like diversity and equality and all these buzzwords mm -hmm. which i think are are more politicized today than ever but that's real like diversity and equality and inclusion and all those kind of buzzwords those need to be with everybody yeah. Um, including people who think and believe different than you. And so if we do, if we get there, I think that's where real change can happen. But yeah. right now I just don't see it happening because too many people want to be put, you know, want to put other people in certain areas and label them and, and not deal with them. So yeah, it's hard. It's a hard time, but I think, I think there's hope, you know, I mean, I, my faith will always make me believe that there is hope, you know, there yep. is something greater to, to strive for and believe for. And I think more conversations that can be had like ours right now, I think the better. But Jason, man, this has been a treat for us. I mean, guys, <laughs> this is amazing. You guys are the best. <laughs> to, to, to go from your story to the transformation from sports to significance. But yeah. my man, AG, got one more for you. All right. Let's see. Let's hear it. Accomplished career, man, in, in sports broadcasting. I just want to say I applaud you for. Thanks, just brother. going, just going with it, and, and and just sticking your nose, and then, and then people, other people, doing just laying, you know, like oh girl took your resume in there, like you know yeah. that's a, that's a big part of, of why you talking to us right now. So Absolutely. we, I just we we both want to know what's the next chapter in your hoop dream. I love this question. So a couple of things that I dream about, right? Cause I don't know exactly what it's going to mm -hmm. look like. I, you know, you hope you make it to 50 and then you hope you can go from there. But I, I dream about from a personal standpoint, watching my daughter, um, marry a man who loves God and loves her in an amazing way. Like that's a dream. I want to live and I want to see her find her, her person to be with for the rest of her life. So that's, that's part of that book. There's no mm -hmm. doubt of that next chapter. Being empty nesters with my wife is a, is an interesting chapter that's going to be coming soon. Mm. And that's a whole new thing that I'm not sure if we're ready for that, to be quite honest, because we've invested so much into our daughter that we might need to relearn how to be married again. And I don't mean that in a, our marriage is great, but like we might need to learn how to be married without a child in the without house. Without a child, and right. That's different. So that's that chapter is there. From a professional standpoint, I think the next dream, the next logical step would be to try and do documentaries or some sort of 30 for 30 type of series for sports spectrum that tells the faith and sports element, but from that type of way of telling Whoa. it versus a podcast. So I dream about that. Um, I don't know if that'll ever happen. Uh, I believe if it's meant to happen, it'll happen. Uh, but that's, that's a chapter that would be in, really intriguing to me. Um, and honestly, it might not even be with Sports Spectrum. I, I hate saying that because my boss probably listens and is like, what do you mean? I'm not trying to leave. <laughs> I'm so comfortable right now where I am in my skin that it's like if if God wants to blow all this up and take me somewhere else, then then I'll then I'll go. I'll I'm that. not scared of that anymore. <laughs> right. You know? When I was at ESPN, I was scared of that. I'm not scared of that anymore. So I'm I'm mm. more excited now in my life than I probably ever was the first 47 years I've been alive. And uh, so I think, yeah, the more important stuff is my my family, my daughter and my wife. And and that that's the that's the real hoop dream. You know, being a grandfather someday. Yeah, oh, my yeah. gosh. Yes. I don't I, I, I don't know if either of you guys are grandpas yet, but like yeah, that. We both are. are. You, yeah. OK, mm -hmm. so I I'm not there yet. My brother is. And. I just remember how important my grandfather was in my life. And that's a chapter that I don't want to rush it, if you know what I mean. Right, but, right. <laughs> uh, but if I'm excited for when it's time for that to happen, I'm excited for that to happen as well, for sure. I said this at the beginning, but I uh, I love Hoop Dreams and getting to know both of you guys is kind of cool for mm -hmm. me just from when I was like a high school kid. But even now, um, just where we all are in our lives, it's been an honor. So thank you for having me. This is this has been the, one of the coolest things I've done in a long time. So I appreciate you guys. Bella on the bell.
I'm the gold of my era. I've been a trending topic. I'm as fly as a feather. My pocket's macroscopic. See, with time, I get better. I'm always in the action, kid. No, I got it locked from Chicago where the toughest live. Concrete jungle, earn my stripes on the pavement there. You make it here, then you can make it anywhere. No comparison. Your game is embarrassing. No one can touch me. I'm all but going there again. Yeah, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith, think I'm balling like I'm Martha Agee. I'm box office, and one day they gon' have to pay me. Yeah, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith, think I'm balling like I'm Martha Agee. I'm box office, and one day. Hoop Dreams, the podcast, an Unlearning Network production. Written and produced by Arthur Agee, Will Gates, Matt Hoffer, and Chantel Shan. With audio engineering by Matt Savage. For more episodes, check us out at www.unlearningnetwork.com. The money get us. Gotta be a dog to survive in this cold weather. Ice in my veins, no need for a warm sweater. I'm coming for it all, best believe I won't let up, yeah. Hey, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith, think I'm balling like I'm Martha Agee. I'm box office and one day they gon' have to pay me. Yeah, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith, think I'm balling like I'm Martha Agee. I'm box office and one day they gon' have to pay me. Yeah.